She's going to text me when we are live. All right, we are live. So with that, uh, we will uh, return from uh, our in-camera session. And the first item that we have is a motion to adopt the May 25th regular council meeting minutes. Uh, Councillor Sperling, would you like to put that motion on? I'll make the motion to adopt the uh, May 21st uh, regular council minute meetings as printed and circulated. Thank you. Um, with everybody on here, I will just look to see if there's any errors or omissions. Not seeing any, I will close the motion on the May 25th uh, regular council meeting minutes. Uh, it is now closed and we will be voting on our iPads. So please cast your vote when it comes up. Voted in the uh, in affirmative. Um, I clicked it off by mistake. Thank you. Did it come up for everybody? Or yeah. your worship, okay. I haven't got you signed in, and I also need it for Councillor Abatoy. Okay, I've got mine sitting here. I vote in the affirmative. I'll um, exit off, and I will try and re-sign in. But I will vote in the affirmative. Voting favor as well. Miss X, say I can't see anything on this. And that was carried. I assume it was carried unanimously. Correct. Okay, thank you. So that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no delegations who are pre-registered to speak. Uh, so our next one is a presentation from Edmonton Global regarding Edmonton Region Air Services Opportunity Fund. At this point in time, I would ask for Malcolm Bruce to join us, and uh, he is accompanied by um, Tom Ruth from the Edmonton International Airport. So if you'd like to uh, put your cameras on. Uh, Mr. Bruce, I would turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Mayor and Council, for uh, this great opportunity to be able to uh, come and speak with you on this important initiative. And perhaps, if I may just say a few opening comments before we open to questions, is really just to highlight the journey that we've been on over the last 15 months and, and really what's culminating in, in this discussion point today. Um, some of you may or may not be aware, but 15 months ago, the uh, the grouping called the Airport Accord, which consists of Leduc County, Leduc City, uh, Edmonton, and the airport, uh, uh, approached Edmonton Global uh, to help facilitate a conversation around air services at the regional level. And, and this was, of course, uh, in response to this unprecedented uh, arrival of the pandemic, COVID, and the significant impact that it has had on air services to our region. Uh, our airport is the fifth largest in Canada, the fifth busiest, uh, and it was one of the ones that was not going to be kept open for um, traffic uh, to international destinations and has uh, subsequently moved from 52 direct flights to 13 direct flights that are now servicing our region. Uh, through the conversation, uh, avenues were explored about how we could prime the pump, how we could get ourselves well positioned so when we we're able to reopen the airport to international travel, how would we be able to entice airlines back to uh, uh, the servicing the, the region at scale in, in a way that would not only help us recover, but accelerate out of the recovery phase and hopefully into a, a more prominent growth phase. Uh, and really that is the impetus behind this discussion that we are now calling about the Regional Air Services Opportunity Fund uh, that is before us today. So I'm quite happy to take any questions, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, and as indicated, I have my colleagues, Tom Ruth, who's the CEO of the airport, 
uh, and he has a number of his vice presidents here as well that can help uh, answer questions if uh, uh, who will probably be far more capable than I will be on, on a number of these that they may arise. Okay, thank you very much. So with that, um, I'm actually first on uh, questions, but in order to get it back into a proper rotation, I will go to Councillor Lennox first. Thank you, and thank you uh, for the presentation. I do have uh, a few questions. Um, first of all, just wondering, you know, because I consider then if we participate in this as investors um, in this in this process, and so as an investor, um, I'm wondering why we're going with just a straight grant as opposed to some sort of loan or line of credit or something um, that enables our municipality and our residents to get money in return um, on this investment. Um, so there are, uh, as you can appreciate, there's really three uh, significant outcomes from direct flights. Um, there is the business community, uh, in terms of their ability to move product or uh, themselves or services uh, outside of our region. Uh, and I think it's, before I even start there, I think it's important to note that our region is a fly in, fly out. That is the best bridge that we have to connect with not only the rest of the country, but the rest of the world. So it's an important enabler for investment attraction into our region, but also for uh, trade export and also for uh, business leaders to move uh, to where they need to go to where the markets necessarily demand. So it allows businesses to establish themselves here. It still uh, have reach into the global marketplace. Uh, two, it's also about supporting the visitor economy, uh, both into uh, our region, but also our region as a connector to the near north and far north. And then finally, in the third component, it is about the community itself. Uh, every single member, by and large, uh, tends to travel at some point in their lives, and much of that travel nowadays is being done by air. Um, and so the, the airport itself is uh, a medium of which uh, permits our residents in this region to be able to move to uh, places of vacation, places where have loved ones or loved ones coming into them, uh, and gives them that freedom of movement uh, that really helps um, uh, the community as a whole. So while the direct benefit may not uh, be perceived as a dollar for dollar, the uh, the economic impacts and the uh, and the investment dollars uh, will ripple through the entire ec economy, both in indirect ways, but also in direct um, in, in direct investment dollars from companies that come to the industrial heartland, for example, to be able to invest or expand in the, in their current capacities. So I might uh, then take that it was never considered as even just a partial loan or a partial, um, it was always going to be a grant slash gift slash incentive. Co correct. And, and partially is because of the way that, um, par partially because of the way that these things are done. This helps offset a percentage of an overall cost of the, of, uh, of, the, the movement of a new route uh, to our region. Okay. Um, so when I, I just did a little bit of uh, research um, and an article came out in the Edmonton Journal on February 24th um, about uh, Edmonton International Airport receiving an $18 million grant to support a $36 million total expansion of cargo operations. Um, and then another article came out just on June 8th that the International Airport uh, teamed up uh, for Accelerate Food Exports with a federal investment of $550,000. So if some of these other areas um, within Edmonton International Airport are doing very well and have expanded and, have, and are producing, just wondering why you wouldn't take that revenue that it was perhaps unexpected and reinvest it into this side of the operations. Maybe I can address that. Uh, Malcolm, maybe I can address that a little bit. 
um, and, and really good examples there. I, I should say how important, first of all, cargo is to our to our community. And you're you're quite right about uh, the, the cargo impact this year. Is that we were up eight percent. In, in cargo for for last year it was it was a new record uh, and most places were were down like Vancouver was down twenty percent but cargo does not uh, does not generate much revenue for the airport uh, so cargo cargo is really a huge economic generator uh, for the community so that the money that you talked about in terms of the uh, from the federal government and matching funds those are things that we we do at the airport as best we can really for the benefit uh, of the community. It's it's the, the passenger flights and, and some of the other development we do at the airport that, that we, we use. Again, we're a not-for-profit to keep the airport uh, running for the benefit of the, of the community. And if I may amplify, um, if you think about what we're trying to do, and let's just use food and agriculture as an example, we are trying to create value add in the supply chains or the value chains of particular sectors. Currently right now in the Edmonton metropolitan region, farm sale to value add is one to one. In Ontario, it's one to three. In British Columbia, it's one to three. In the Netherlands, it's one to 30. So $30 for every value add for every $1 of farm sale. And what we're trying to do is create ourselves at the two to one or three to one. So we're getting $3 of value add for $1. Value add by and large tends to get moved differently than bulk commodity projects. And the airport is a critical air bridge to be able to use that with. So the, the, the cargo uh, is uh, a big part of it. But I think it's important that people also remember that 50% of all the cargo that moves moves in the belly of passenger aircraft. So while we saw 8% growth in cargo, we also had, uh, I think it was a 90% reduction at one point of passenger planes at our airport, which then also, when you think about the 8% growth, shows you just how much loss was on the cargo side, not to mention the passenger side as well. So what could have been, if we still had the passenger flights, would have been significantly more. So as we move into the more value add from a regional economy perspective, uh, much more of this will be moving because they're looking for efficiencies in the supply chain and air tends to, to provide that in terms of uh, efficiency. Okay, I'm going to go on. We can always come back to a second round. Councillor Macon, questions? Uh, thank you for uh, coming here this evening. So um, I just want to, because we're in a public session, kind of just re restate the problem that uh, is in front of us with the airport. So um, like most businesses in Alberta, we're in an economic recovery. And for the airport, um, airlines are making plans now for their routes over the next few years. So if we don't get this incentive uh, in front of them to help restore uh, these important uh, routes to, for our region, um, then we'll be, we could potentially be left off the table for several years and that could quite significantly delay some recovery for our area. Would you think that, that is accurate? So, Councillor, that is very accurate. So, uh, we know right now that airlines are, uh, you know, have had the same impacts on their business as every other business in the COVID crisis. Fleets have been reduced, uh, availability as a service has been reduced, and they've been consolidated, particularly on the international traffic into four major hubs in Canada, Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, and Toronto. And we're not a natural hub. WestJet is based out of Calgary, Air Canada is based out of uh, Montreal. So what we're trying to do is prime the pump uh, to get us back at the forefront of some of the planning figures. So when we're allowed to go back into international traffic, that we've got uh, ourselves ready and able, and quite frankly, uh, are well positioned to uh, um, to uh, look to the future, not just to accelerate out of recovery, but also to look for future growth. Uh, thank you for that response. And then um, my sub. My second question for now, I guess, would be when if Fort Saskatchewan is looking at this specifically is what this could mean for us. 
Um, when we are, when our area, the industrial heartland is competing for industrial projects, how important would you say it was to these industry partners that this transportation uh, infrastructure is in place for them? Um, so it's critically important. Uh, businesses, one of the top questions they ask is connectedness. So how are we connected to be able to create that bridge that they need to be able to move people uh, and equipment and those kind of things back and forth? Um, so I have been in conversations with the uh, CEO uh, or the executive director of the Alberta Industrial Heartland around this. And he's very supportive of the initiative, as well as your Chamber of Commerce. And so your Chamber of Commerce as well is very supportive of the initiative. And what we ask of business, and, and of course, because everybody has a role to play, is helping us get these flights to a sustainable level. So they don't need any uh, offsets that these flights are able to stand there on two feet. And people using those flights, in particular business, uh, goes a long way to driving that. So uh, the conversations we've had with the Chamber, the conversations we have at uh, Alberta Industrial Heartland have been very positive towards this initiative because they see the value of the, the air bridges that go to these critical markets that they uh, they need to connect with. Thank you. Uh, that'll be good for me for this round, Mayor Ketcher. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, and thank you, gentlemen. The first thought I had when I read the presentation was Fort Saskatchewan is a beneficiary of the airport, but primarily the municipalities that benefit the most are those that are able to tax the airport facility itself. So, so I tried to research that and truly that information seems to be buried. So direct question, does the airport itself pay property taxes like a normal commercial enterprise in Alberta? Does it assess the same way and does it pay on the same rates? I can answer that. Yes, we do pay uh, property taxes and we're assessed and we, we also pay um, a, a land rent to the federal government. Thank you. So, but the property taxes that you do pay, is that on market value of your facility? Like a, like, like a machinery equipment tax or a, a commercial enterprise, for instance, market value of the building that I own in downtown Fort Saskatchewan? Maybe uh, Myron Keen can answer as, as best we can uh, a specific question around the, the, the taxes that we pay. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the question. Uh, property taxes on the airport are assessed in a different manner than would be. Sorry. Okay, we can't I'm, hear you, Myron. Can you hear me a little bit better now? I apologize. Uh, property taxes are assessed by the province. There's both a uh, I'll call it a regulated and unregulated components in airports. All the aviation infrastructure, etc., is not valued on the infrastructure itself for an assessment. The buildings, etc., are assessed on a on a market value perspective. Again, keeping in mind the market value of the airport is. Is, is is something to be questioned as far as what you can actually sell and use it for are the tenants on the airport property pay commercial taxes as if there are any other commercial business well thank you Martin. in 2019 or 20 take either one i don't care what did the airport pay to property taxes and what municipalities received those, those monies Uh, sorry, so just I, I'm going to go off a little bit off memory. I don't have them in front of me. The property tax assessment, I think for us in 2020 at the international is about $5.2 million in total. Uh, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, I don't have the exact number. The funds go to city of, uh, sorry, to Leduc County. And then I can't speak to the tax sharing arrangement that they have uh, related to that. So Leduc County spreads that out amongst who? I don't know that I'm best to be able to answer all those uh, questions, uh, Councillor Kelly. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to think about that, uh, Mayor Catcher, and um, I'll be interjoined on the next round. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Avatoye. Questions? Yes, um, thank you for your presentation, gentlemen. Um, so this program is um, specifically for municipalities for 15 million. Um, do you? have a similar um, program for businesses to support the um, the airport? So, so thank you, Councillor, for the, uh, so we've 
our ask of businesses is to use the flights that we bring here. Um, and we think that's the important contribution that they can make as well as obviously on the advocacy front uh, when we're dealing with our other partners. So uh, the business has been very receptive to uh, the acknowledgement of the importance of the air linkage through the airport as well as this initiative. Okay, thank you. Um, so 300,000, um, 300 and some thousand, that's what, that's what city of Fort Saskatchewan, that's what they ask for city of Fort Saskatchewan. Um, and this is for three years. And so what happens after three years? So, um, the, the intent is, uh, is, is really, we want to jumpstart the return to full international, um, uh, operations in terms of our, our flights and the availability of those flights. Um, we believe that uh, this will help us get to where we need to be in the next three years. And then afterwards, the intent is, as you know, um, that, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. So there will be other in, uh, opportunities for flights to see that there's a market here, that there are flights that are being very successful and profitable. Uh, and as we had seen uh, prior to COVID, is that you know confidence in our ability to move people as services and goods and grow the airline business here was quite high uh, and we're uh, expecting that to be returning once we get this going so if there's a if there's um if there's a likelihood that it will take three to five years for things to go back to normal my question though is that are you going to be coming back to municipalities to um ask for more support so the intent today is no, uh, because what we said was that recovery is forecasted in uh, that five year mark for us because we're a non hub and we think this fund is going to help us accelerate that uh, up to that three year mark. So really what we're saying is this is about getting us back into the game, convincing airlines that, you know, uh, who have also, as we indicated, have taken a number of uh, hits on the business front, their fleets have been reduced and the like, that we are a great market to be part of, uh, and they see that the community is backing them coming back here, uh, and uh, that's the intent of this uh, of this particular fund. So it's, it's a, a, a one-time ask that we are uh, presenting to Council today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Is it fair to say that airports operate in a, a competitive market? Yes. And this is a, an opportunity to ensure that we're as competitive as we can be in the Edmonton region. Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you. That's all I needed to ask. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Sperling. Thanks again for uh, being available today to present to us. Um, I guess just the one question I have, um, maybe at a higher level, is just, um, you know, in terms of, and I'm not sure you you, you might have an answer for this, but uh, I'm sure you have a, your own perspective. But do we attract, because we have an international airport in Edmonton, and I think it impacts both central and northern Alberta. Um, do we attract people and business to this region because we have an international airport? Yes. Okay. So if we lost our status as an international airport, what is the potential outcome of that for the region? So there are two. Um, one, we will become a dependency of a hub airport somewhere else. So we will no longer be in the driver's seat, which impacts on our economic ability to grow in the way that we believe uh, best reflects the strengths and the attributes that we have in this region. So that's one. The second one is sustaining the current business loads that we have today. I have spoken to a number of CEOs, uh, and I won't mention any names, that have indicated to me that if they can't fly from here, then they'll move their business to a place where they can fly from. Thank you. Thank you. I'm next in uh, order. Um, so my questions were similar to Councillor Sperling's about, you know, the impact on the region. And I guess when we talk about return on investment, the I'm assuming the return on investment is jobs, economic development. Can you just expand on that? 
So I, I'll talk about it from a macro level, and and these aren't numbers that EIA or ourselves have put together, but they're really numbers that come from globally competent firms that deal in this space that track this kind of outcomes all the time. So uh, the numbers that we're working with for a $15 million investment that has the opportunity to create up to 7,000 jobs, $485 million in GDP impact, and then uh, the larger economic impact through indirect is about 815 million. So it's significant upside for the investment we're looking at to help uh, create that sort of, as I, as I indicated before, kind of priming the pump to jumpstart the economy once we're into the recovery mode. Thank you. And then the second question. So if we were unable to uh, attract uh, um, direct flights, I guess the impact on our citizens. Now you live in Sturgeon County, we live in Fort Saskatchewan and all the citizens that live uh, in the region that aren't in Leduc or Leduc County, but uh, the impact that it would have on, on all of our citizens because I assume then uh, if we're not designated or have these direct international flights, then they have to go out of Calgary. Or Vancouver or, you know, trying to get to another hub, like, for example, Toronto. Uh, and I, you know, I use my daughter as my example all the time, but, you know, for her to get back to uh, Waterloo, it took her over six hours just to get to Toronto. And that's, and, and people say that's not very long, but it was a three and a half hour wait in Calgary to be able to connect to a flight that then got them into Toronto. So for us, it's very important to uh, understand that efficiencies, convenience are factors that people look at when they're traveling. And so uh, there's 1.4 million of us in this region. We believe we're growing at the rate that we continue to grow even through COVID. We forecast by 2044, we're gonna be 2.4 million people. Uh, we need an airport that's going to service that, given who we are and, and the context of where we are. Geographically, we're located where we are, uh, and we need this service to be able to get us uh, through that uh, to that growth that we're forecasting. I might add, too, that um, these air pipelines are so important to us. Just a couple specific examples uh, is uh, European flight creates about $30 million of uh, annual impact, 300. Uh, 64 uh, full-time equivalent jobs, 19 million in wages, a cargo, uh, like two times a week cargo flight. And again, cargo is a gr of growing importance to all our business and jobs in the community is $70 million annually with about 380 jobs. And that's just two specific examples. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go on to round two of questions. Uh, Councillor Lennox. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bruce, you, when you answered one of the, and I can't remember which counselor asked the question, but you, you said, when we go back to international flights. So it wasn't if we go back to international flights, it is anticipated that it, we will go back to international flights. So the risk of not having an international airport is actually quite low. Would you agree with that? Uh, I would caveat that counselor with uh, the criteria. So, for example, Saskatoon's an international airport, but it only has one international flight. So, and it's really deemed to be a regional airport. So, you may have a flight or two. Wood Buffalo has a couple of international flights to some destinations uh, and perhaps one or two others. But by and large, they're not deemed to be international in the scale that we're talking about. So, when I use that term, I really mean a robust uh, you know, uh, destination that has connectedness with a number of global, uh, global uh, marketplaces that was EIA uh, and where we want to go back to. So we're not, and I, no disparaging remarks against Saskatoon or anything, but we don't want to be Saskatoon. We want to be the fifth and hopefully a larger airport on a go forward basis. And I agree with that, but also Saskatoon is what a couple hundred thousand people relatively isolated where you just said that the projected population of this area is going to be 2.4 million people. So I don't know that there's a really a comparison there. Is there? Uh, I could use Winnipeg. I could use Halifax. I could use Ottawa. They're all closed down right now. And the pain points for all of those airports, because they are the 
We're the fifth, they're the sixth, seventh, and eighth largest airports in Canada. And they're significantly smaller in volume than they are, though they're servicing populations that are roughly not quite our size, but close to our size. Uh, and they uh, they don't have the same level uh, that we've been supporting. So we have a much different flavor because of our geographic location um, in the in the physical context of where we are positioned in Canada that uh, really enables us to, uh, to to promote the air bridges and the air pipelines like the other ones cannot. As well as the fact that we have a, one of the four large airports, Calgary, as a, as a major hub just south of us. Okay, that's fair, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Macon. Further questions? Thank you. Uh, some of my questions have already been answered. Um, and but just so that we state it out in public as well, can you maybe just talk um, about how the risks are um, reduced by the way that this will be handled? Uh, thank you. Great question. So uh, the intent is, of course, is that there is no uh, money that flows from the fund uh, to a particular uh, uh, opportunity without a, a signed contract. So, you know, there has to be a commitment of uh, a, a flight being established into our region uh, before anything else occurs. So that's really the de-risking. So the investment is uh, is actually seeing a tangible result that occurs. Uh, and then we report on those results um, through our accountability framework uh, that is built into uh, the Edmonton global structure. So. Uh, accountability is back to the shareholders uh, in a transparent and fiduciary way. And this question is probably more uh, to one of our representatives from the airport, but we talked about this being about um, economic recovery. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the impacts um, of this on personal travel? And um, as much as I see um, the benefits of a project like this from a, a from an economic uh, perspective, I also see that um, I think that there would be a lot of support um, just from personal quality of life um, perspective and, and how people can travel and get away from our region. Uh, absolutely. And uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the business traffic because that that's an important inducement for a lot of the other economic impact and for the jobs. But uh, a lot of this is is it will help um, not only individuals and give us more choices uh, on different places that that we can go, but that inbound the inbound people that 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 come here, the visitor economy is so important to us. It's about one out of every ten jobs, and a lot of those job a lot of those jobs are for for young people just getting a start in in uh, their work lives. That and so. Um, in addition to all the business imperatives for this, um, you're quite right that there's these there's the, um, the 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 tourism and visitor economy imperative, as well as the quality of life for each of us to have options to be able to to visit friends and family and and places that are important to us. Thank you. That's good for me, Mayor Ketcher. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. Uh, just to continue with my prior questioning on the taxes. Um, did you give any thought to a model for allocation of this 15 million that was that perhaps weighted the, 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 the sharing of the cost a little more heavily to those municipalities that received the property tax of five million dollars from the airport? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, one of the things that uh, what came up in discussion uh, over the course of this as we're building out this program is uh, this direct cost benefit analysis. Um, and I will say that there was some discussion and, and nobody's landed on any uh, decision, except that we recognize that the fund establishment is very important to start to get the message out into the global marketplace that we are serious about. Uh, you know, attracting uh, flights back into the Edmonton metropolitan region. Um, 
but that's not to say that it's at the uh, exclusiveness of everything else. So one of the, the topics of conversation that's going to occur at the shareholder meeting on Thursday and potentially with the CAOs next week is, is there an appetite to look at the cost sharing formula after year one to maybe look at a weighted effort uh, for years two and three? Uh, but I will also uh, note a caution uh, that was uh, articulated quite uh, quite robustly was, you know, uh, these these cost sharing formulas were built and they took a lot of time to put together, uh, and they found to be very equitable and fair. Uh, so to open them up again uh, may be a very challenge to, to to batten them all down afterwards. So I think there's a little bit of water to go under this bridge first, councillor, before we come to a, a final decision on it. And I understand that. I'm sure the discussion wouldn't be easy. I wonder if any one of you could give me some history, please. Edmonton Airport has one of the largest footprints in the country, certainly larger than Calgary Airport. And yet Calgary is a hub because they have WestJet. How is it what happened in history that WestJet ended up in Calgary and not Edmonton? Um, any, any information you could share on that? In other words, how do we become a hub? Um, there's, there's a good question. It would be great to get a new airline to come in here and establish a headquarters and, uh, you know, create a hub here. Uh, but, you know, that's very, that's a very daunting task to attract a new airline because they're in this particular time, they're very challenged, uh, to try and create a new airline in these circumstances, not impossible, but very challenging. So that's one method, but I'm not an expert in this by any stretch of the imagination. Um, okay, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Further questions? Yeah, just, just one last question. Um, so, how have we been in talks with the airlines that used to be um, that used to run flights from out of EIA? I'm really saying about bringing those flights back to um, the the airport. I mean, international flights. So, for me, question for me on that. So the uh, and, and I believe the question is what are they um, uh, what are they currently saying? They're they're I, I will tell you that they're they're concentrating on the hubs right now. And and again, it goes back to a bit of an earlier conversation around um, they they certainly have less less planes out there right now because of their they they the devastation of the devastating effect that uh, COVID's had. So there's less fleet there um, and and. So that's that's what we're really trying to do with this fund. Again, as the fifth largest airport, j just beyond the hubs of the of the uh, of the top four, is is it'll be really important for us to induce this travel back with the with the business community and the community support, along with what we'll do at the airport to continue to run the efficient airport and to help out as well with um, where we can where we can uh, help induce these flights. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Harris, anything further? Um, what have you done or what work have you done with the federal government to prioritize our airport in it, the Edmonton region and the need for direct flights? I mean, I understand the ask for the money to be able to do it on our own, but what have you done, if anything, uh, to, I guess, for, for the public record to prioritize what you're doing? in our discussions with the federal government. So thank you. We've had a very concerted advocacy campaign for about 15 months ongoing with the federal government through a series of, of uh, um, platforms. So the first one is I'm the board chair of the Consider Canada City Alliance, which represents the 12 largest economies in Canada. And we have been advocating since March of 2020 the need to get airports back up and running in this country to be able to get the economic recovery going as early as last year. So I've met personally with uh, upwards of six federal ministers and have spoken this and used the Edmonton Metropolitan Region as an example of why uh, the importance of the air bridge. Additionally, uh, uh, and your mayor was one of the signatories, we had the 14 communities uh, sign a letter uh, to the prime minister, as well as a number of federal government uh, or federal ministers uh, about the need to reopen the airport this year, uh, as well as um, uh, 
uh, on the provincial side, a number of engagements, both at the provincial government and with individual ministers about the importance of the airport and the need to get it uh, open. Uh, what we're really trying to get out of the federal government is the criteria that they're going to use to say the airport reopens. And we think that that's probably going to happen on very short notice. Um, so what this helps us do is prepare for uh, that particular moment in time so that we're well poised to take advantage of it when we get back into the space in a very uh, quick way. So this is really a multilateral activity, so to speak. Very much so, Councillor. And, and, and I know Tom's been working with his counterparts as well, but I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, it's been a full, full, um, Malcolm pretty much covered everything. It's just, we need to be ready to pounce when, uh, when this, when this flight, when these flights come back and airlines are beginning to make decisions now for, for into the future. So it's really critical for all of us. So that leads me to my last question. How are you going to show the direct line of sight between the work that we're doing here and the money for the new flights? Um, so thanks for that, Councillor. It, it goes back to uh, no money gets dispersed until we have a we have one flight that's going to start flying on a direct route. So, you know, a direct line of sight is a new route uh, for an investment made, and and an investment's not made until that flight's confirmed. Gentlemen, thanks for your good work and your response to the questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. Anything further? No further questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to look to see if there's any additional questions. Okay, not seeing any. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bruce and Mr. Ruth for and your associates who are on here for coming and answering questions and doing the presentation. So at this point in time, uh, we will um, ask you to leave our next item of business. Uh, will actually be business arising from the presentation. So, so uh, once we get into that, then uh, any questions would be answered by our administration to council. So thank you very much and uh, very nice to see you. You are welcome to go on to the YouTube and uh, watch uh, discussion and debate if you like. Thank you. So, thank, you. thank you very much for the opportunity and a real pleasure to uh, have this chance to engage on this important topic. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, so uh, we will go directly to business arising from the presentation. Mr. Fleming, you are presenting. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so I just have a short presentation. I really think that um, the the questions and comments generally covered everything, and and um, this is a bit of a challenging one. This isn't a subject matter expertise area for uh, for the city, so uh, we'll do our best here to to put this one forward and uh, for council's discussion and debate. Um, so the background on this one, as we just heard, is that uh, there is concern that the region may lose a number of our direct international flights. Um, the issue was identified by Edmonton Global and the Edmonton International Airport. And I believe the airport accords uh, members were involved as well. Um, currently, the federal air travel restrictions don't allow for direct international flights into the city of Edmonton, into the Edmonton International Airport. Um, and this is creating a fear that um, as the airlines begin their planning for the next two plus years, um, that they may not look at bringing some of those flights back. Um, and they do look closely at the financial impacts of, um, of decisions when they look to locate a flight. And the concern is that the Edmonton International Airport could be left out of those decisions if action isn't taken. Um, the offsetting airport fees, if you have the ability to offset the airport fees, that can entice airlines to want to maintain or add flights. And um, it is important that the Edmonton region is in their future plans. And a lot of this is being presented as a bit of a COVID uh, recovery matter, um, something that we want to get on top of um, before we before we fall behind. So why is this important? Air travel does factor into the convenience and uh, 
um, corporate investment decisions and quality of life. Um, it is certainly a des it's desirable for the region to be a major international hub and have a major international airport here rather than a regional hub, so to speak. Um, difficult for me to quantify those uh, benefits, but um, does seem to be a, a pretty well well accepted fact that it is better for us to have a um, a strong international airport in the region. At this time, there's no funding from other orders of a government for this type of thing. Um, I do know that there are programs and negotiations and there've been bailouts for airlines and things. Um, but if you look at the specific um, activities that we're trying to incent with this, um, I don't think there's any other funding for this type of thing specifically. There may be funding for airport operations or, or airline bailouts, but um, the specific funding for these international flights is probably unique to this request. Um, and there are benefits to the region as a whole, although, as has been mentioned already, um, not all municipalities will necessarily um, benefit equally from uh, from this kind of a program. To some of the considerations in general, the fund would be managed by Edmonton Global. Um, the idea behind that is Edmonton Global does have some accountability back to the municipalities, whereas the airport does not, um, as we are shareholders of Edmonton Global. so. Uh, the money would go to an organization that uh, that is accountable to us. Um, the incentives are only paid out if the flights are booked and a, and a contract is signed. So um, there is some risk management in that. And we do want to consider um, what some of the other municipalities are going to be doing at this point in time. I'm only aware that the city of Edmonton has made the commitment. So of the 15 million dollars, I, I believe that covers around 10 million of it or so. Um, I'm not aware of what any other municipalities have done um, yet. The financial impact would be spread over three years. Um, the, the commitment for this year would be $70,000. And then um, in upcoming years, it would be just over $141,000 for 2022 and 2023. Um, we would recommend the use of the financial stabilization reserve. Um, that is where our... our um, our surpluses went from uh, the last budget year and where the, the funding um, that we received from the federal government, the municipal operating support transfer went into that fund as well. Um, and one of the major risks here, um, which is, again, it's difficult to quantify this one, but um, there is a possibility that um, the flights could return without this incentive. It's, it's difficult for us to know for sure you know, in an alternate universe, if if we weren't to do this, um, would we still get the same outcomes? That's hard to say. Um, doing this um, is meant to try to mitigate the risk that the flights aren't brought back. But um, I think as it has been stated earlier, it, it is possible that they could come back again due to market demand. Um, this incentive is really meant to, bet, to kind of um, influence this two, three year period. Um, so the recommendation, the report does have a recommendation from administration um, that we believe um, there's value in supporting this. Although our overriding recommendation for today is that council defer the funding request um, to be moved to the June 22nd regular meeting of, of council for consideration. Um, at the time when we were writing the report, um, which we have to have it in roughly about a week before this, um, we believe that the timelines were a little tighter than they actually are and that other municipalities will be making the decision on uh, possibly June 15th or June 22nd. So um, we do have some time that's been afforded to us. So that's why we put that, um, I put this recommendation here for consideration. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll uh, end for questions uh, and debate. So we'll go to questions first. Councillor Macon, you're first on questions. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, you said you weren't a subject matter expert on this matter. I think that the city has a lot of experience being subject matter expertise in the final when approving getting industrial project approved for our area. So would you say, um, based on our past experiences, um, 
with these projects and the competitiveness that we have with other markets that this is one of the things that is important for us to continue to be competitive in these negotiations. Um, again, your to your worship, I, I don't know in this particular case if we're if we're enough of a subject matter expert um, to comment on that. I would say that um, as we as we approved late last year, we did improve an incentive policy because we believe as a city that um, incentives do matter when you are in a competitive environment for investment. Um, and so I would say this this request. It's probably consistent with that same philosophy that incentives can uh, make a difference, at least in the short term. It's hard to say that they would influence the long term, but um, it, it's probably similar in that regard. That's good for me. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Troy. You caught me by surprise with the recommendation that we defer the funding request. Um, I need more clarification on that. Why, why is administration now making that suggestion to council? Um, and through your worship, I, it, it is just an option for council. If council's ready to move forward with the decision tonight, that's perfectly fine as well. And, and, um, and then there's no need to bring it back on June 22nd. Um, I think the idea behind the recommendation is that it simply would just give us more time to reflect and. Um, we may learn something from um, some of the reports that uh, some of the other councils consider. Um, and then it would just give you more time to get feedback from the general public. So I think it's just. It, this felt really rushed when we put this report together last week, and so um, there just may be some more. Um, um, knowledge or wisdom that comes our way in the meantime, but if council believes. That after we've just had the last hour's worth of questions and comments that they're ready to make a decision, that's fine as well. So, if I'm reading between the lines, then you're just suggesting that it might be possible for us to wait to see what other councils have to say on the issue. I think knowing what the others do um, would provide some value. Um, so there's that, and then I think it just gives us the ability to have two more weeks uh, if there's any desire to research. I don't think there's anything else that administration necessarily has um, that we're going to be able to bring forward on June 22nd. But having said that, I probably would be paying close attention to um, uh, how this is going in other municipalities. And like I said, perhaps somebody else has thought of something that we haven't. In addition to that, there's also an Edmonton Global Shareholders Meeting Later this week, where I think this is going to be discussed, so we may learn something from that as well. So, you mentioned, I think, in response to Councillor Macon's question, our policy on on new policy regarding potential incentives that, that arose due to a change in the Municipal Government Act. Um, Without, to the best of your knowledge, is there any shortage of air traffic capability, direct flight capability to our international North American competitors for, for petrochemical industries such as the Gulf Coast? Do you think they suffer the same restrictions on air travel that perhaps Edmonton does? Um, through your worship, to the best of my knowledge, as a as a, not a subject matter expert on that, but I do believe that at the moment the Gulf Coast would not be suffering from the same restrictions and that the southern states in the in the US have opened up. Well, in some cases they barely closed, but the um, the reopenings were quite quick and and um, efficient in the United States. Okay, thanks, Troy. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Actually, Mr. Fleming, do you just want to put that down for now so we can see everybody and we can always put it back up again if you need to? Okay, and I'm on to Councillor Abatoye. Yeah, so I was going to say we don't want to be pace setters. Just kidding. 
Um, so my question, um, so Council, Councilor, Councilor Kelly already asked, um, asked my question, but my question is going to be about the reserves because I know that um, the financial st um, stabilization reserves is for, uh, you know, it's kind of um, provides a buffer for our budget whenever we go either, either we have a surplus or a deficit. Uh, so are we st still sitting pretty tight, um, nicely in that reserves to be able to um, dish, us, dish out this amount? Uh, yeah, through your worship, I I didn't um, I didn't look up the op where we are relative to the optimal balance of that reserve, but I do know that we we did place a um, a fair amount of money in it from the 2020 surplus, and um, I did look through the different reserves we contemplated possibly the economic development reserve or um, or and well, and the other reserves are infrastructure reserves, and they really didn't seem to be appropriate. So this just seemed to be the the most appropriate place and. And I do believe that, um, I mean, depending on how things go for us in the future, I do believe we can manage this amount. Okay, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Clarifying questions, Councillor Harris? I don't have any clarifying questions. I think it's all been asked. I'm ready to move forward with the report. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sperling? So, in terms of moving forward tonight, I was I was uh, quite prepared to uh, to consider one of the uh, options here, but just just in consideration of the other munis voting over the next uh, week or two weeks, um, what happens if three of those munis decide they don't want to participate, and we've got this big chunk of dollars that have to be would they have would they reallocate that chunk? of cost to those munis that are participating? Uh, through your worship, that question's come up a few times in the in the conversations I've been involved in in this, and the response has, has been that they won't come back and ask for more from the municipalities that do participate. They will just move forward with a smaller fund and do the best they can with it. It's already been two thirds. I mean, I think I, I believe Edmonton's portion was around two million dollars. It's it's uh, or sorry, ten million dollars. Yeah. So they're already two thirds of the way there. But they so there was no intent. There was sorry. There was no intent to ask the others to make up the share if somebody doesn't participate. Okay. So I'd be prepared if we choose to. I would support moving, making a decision tonight. That's just my opinion. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to, okay. So I guess the only question that I had is, uh, so you're talking about financial stabilization reserve with this. And, and I know you talked about the economic development reserve, but this would this not potentially have been a better reserve to utilize that uh, funding for if council were to go ahead, given that this is an economic um, strategy, I guess I'll say. Uh, yeah, through your worship, that is, that is why we consider that one, but um, to be blunt, we're, we've got uh, plans for that reserve that we would like to discuss with council. I believe the report on that for the downtown um, action plan will come to council next week. And so it's our preference to leave that reserve uh, and utilize it for uh, that initiative. Okay. If council chooses, pending council approval, of course, but yes. Okay. And I guess the other question that I have is, does it matter as we make our decision um, what some of the other municipalities are, are doing? I guess that's the question that I have, because when we talk about sharing investment with shared benefit, um, I guess if some of them don't believe there's a benefit, I guess that's the question we have to ask ourselves, is there a benefit? So. Um, I'm not sure what difference it makes, what order these come out in. Yeah, through your worship and, and to the other members of council who've said the same, if you're confident in that you've been given enough information to make this decision now, I don't think there's anything wrong with that if, if, you, if you feel good about it. Um, and I would agree with you too, if we think it's the right thing to do, then the actions of the other municipalities um, don't, need to, don't need to factor in. So. Um, if you're ready to move forward now, um, that's a, that's an acceptable choice. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lennox. Clarifying questions. I'm just wondering if if 
the city of Fort Saskatchewan is privy to the agreement. Um, and I should ask this question while our guests were on. I'm just wondering if is Global Edmonton, are you aware, getting any administrative fees from this agreement? Like usually when an organization is in charge of allocating funds, they charge a certain percentage of that amount in order to disperse those funds. Is that happening in this situation? Um, through your worship, there was a question that that was asked in a meeting I participated in and around that and the response back was that Edmonton Global would be using just existing resources that they have to administrate this. So my my takeaway from that is that there wouldn't be an uh, um, administrative fee charge. Um, the reason, like I said before, the, the, the main reason they would act as an intermediary is just so that the municipalities themselves would have the comfort of knowing that we have some accountability to the administration of it because the Edmonton Global is, a, is accountable to its shareholders. So. The shareholders are one person from a municipality, it's not municipalities themselves. Oh uh, yeah, through your worship, that's correct. Although the municipalities themselves do have the ability to withdraw their participation in Edmonton Global. So I feel as though you're right, the shareholder representative is one member of council, but the council as a whole controls whether or not we participate. So participate in the organization, but not necessarily in the decisions made at the table. Yeah, and and the the model with Edmonton Global is a little different than what we are typically used to because we're actually not the board per se. We are shareholders, so um, there is a board of of um, non elected officials um, that provides that governance function, and the shareholders oversee the board and and um, approve budgets and things. So, All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to look for hands if anybody has any further questions. Okay, it looks like it's only you, Councillor Kelly. So go ahead. Uh, my apology. My question is more in the line of a comment. So I'll wait. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So uh, we will go to a uh, motion. So I guess. Um, Councillor Lennox, you are next on the list for a motion. I'm going to make the recommended motion that Council defer the funding request to support the Edmonton Regional Air Service Opportunity Fund to the June 22nd, 2021 regular meeting for Council for consideration. Okay, just a process question to our, just before we go on on that, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Moulter, Procedurally, is it defer or refer? Ms. Moulter? Um, your Worship, um, it, you know, either one achieves the same thing. Um, typically, we use refer, but we are simply deferring this to another meeting, so I think that would be appropriate. Okay, and uh, is there a requirement to have uh, any ask of for additional information. I just want to make sure that the motion is correct if going forward. There is. Um, and I was going to make the motion to defer um, before council or administration recommended it. I do think that um, we have a duty to consult uh, our Chamber of Commerce um, and our business community. Uh, to at least get um, a sense of how they uh, view this. Uh, and I think about the amount of hoops and the things that we do um, and make our business owners and, and business community jump through in order to get money from uh, the municipality. And although I think I've come around to the importance of it as a region, um, I still have to justify it to the people that live here. 
And so I don't feel like I can do that just yet. Um, so I would like to have a little bit more information um, and a little bit more engagement and information as far as um, we don't even have the financials um, or anything. Like we, we have no, we have no data or real information to move forward. Um, and I, I think it would be a real slap in the face to business owners to just give up three hundred fifty thousand um, dollars and not have any information and not do any sort of consultation. So and I'll leave it at that. Okay, I will take that as speaking in favor. And this is only on a deferral slash referral motion to June twenty second. Those are debatable, so it's only on the referral motion that we are debating at this point in time. So, uh, Councillor Macon on. The referral deferral motion. Um, so I have been speaking to residents and speaking to some business owners and uh, I'm satisfied with the information that we received in our package and the questions that we've had answered asked and answered today. So I am prepared to move forward with the other motions. So, but if it's the will of council, I'm prepared to wait for it to be deferred, but, um. Happy to move forward with it tonight. So I just hear what other members of council feel. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Um, I think I'm prepared to move with the original motion in the package as well. Port Saskatchewan is part of the Industrial Heartland Association. As part of my prep for tonight, I I looked up those folks and they completed a study in July of 2019 entitled the economic impact study um, in 2015 dollars. Regional economic impact for Alberta industrial heartland very close to 3.3 billion dollars per annum estimated provincial impact of that association of that of this area very close to 4.5 billion dollars per annum national impact very close to 5.2 billion dollars per annum um, those numbers make 15 million look like a rounding error and no offense but they really do on top of that uh, wikipedia has a really good description of the edmonton international airport and its traffic volumes at um, 8 million passengers roughly per annum pre-COVID to 2 million passengers per annum COVID, which is still larger, by the way, than, than Saskatoon. Uh, we can't be relegated to an also ran status of Saskatoon or Ottawa or Hamilton or Winnipeg. This area, the economic impact of the 1.5 million people that live in this area are of a national scale. I believe. Councillor Kelly, yeah. sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. This is only on uh, to defer it or to deal with it and tonight. I am explaining why I'm okay. prepared to make the motion tonight. Thank you, Mayor Catcher. Okay. Do I have That's a time fine. limit? No. Thank you. Now that my train of thought is broke, please come back to me on the second round. Okay. Uh, Councillor Abitoye on the deferral motion. Yeah. Um, I, I actually came to this meeting thinking that um, I will, um, I believe that people that this is a, this is a service that I believe that people who benefit from it should pay, uh, who benefit directly from it should pay for it. But I, after hearing all of the conversation that we had today, I really think this is something that we need um, in this region. And so I, I will support us uh, moving forward tonight with the original motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Harris on the referral motion. Um, I can appreciate Councillor Lennox's point of view on this, but we were elected to lead. We were elected to make decisions based on information that we gather as a group of seven. We don't have to go to the community on every major decision. It's time to go big or stay home. So I will not support the referral motion. 
we can and should make a decision on this thing tonight. Uh, and we live with those consequences. That's what we got elected to do. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sperling on the deferral motion. Um, I would prefer to move forward with a decision tonight, so I won't support the deferral motion. Okay, thank you. And I do apologize for interrupting you, Councillor Kelly. So on the deferral motion, I'll come back to you. I think we have consensus. I'll save the rest of it for later, perhaps without interruption. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Lennox, closing on the deferral motion. I think um, Councillor Harris and I have very different views of what it is to represent our community, so, and that's okay. Um, I still uh, believe that there's uh, an opportunity to engage at least the Chamber of Commerce um, to provide some feedback. Um, and I don't see the rush, so I will support the motion. Okay, thank you. So the motion is the deferral motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. The motion is defeated, six to one. All right, um, so we will go back to the main motion. Councillor Lennox, did you wish to put it on? I do not, thanks. Okay, thank you. So I'll move to Councillor Macon. I will make the motion. Uh, sorry, my screen is very small. Uh, I'll make the motion that council amend the 2021 operating budget by approving $354,130 from the financial stabilization reserve for the Edmonton Region Air Services Opportunity Fund to pay, be paid out over a three year period as per the payment schedule shown in the June 8th, 2021 council report. Thank you. Would you like to speak in favor of your motion? I will. Uh, I believe that this is a decision where in five years we can look back and say that we are where we are because the municipalities have the foresight to invest in the future. I believe that the risks of this are low and the potential is significant and deserves our careful consideration. Um, I am satisfied with the funding coming from the financial stabilization reserve. And I don't think that I need to wait and see what other municipalities do. I think that we can be, as was mentioned earlier, trailblazers uh, for this opportunity. It is of significant economic, uh, has a significant economic impact on our region, as well as I believe it means a lot to people personally in our region. So to have an international airport here. So for those reasons and others, I will support this motion. Thanks. Hey, thank you. It's open for discussion and debate. Go ahead, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. Um, the gentleman that presented referenced the limited capacity, current limited capacity and downsized capacity of the existing airlines. And, and uh, from what I've read in the last year, I wholeheartedly believe that they are accurate. Airlines are suffering. The, it's unfortunate in my opinion, that we brought this decision the same week that, or within the same week that companies like Air Canada decided to declare $10 million of bonuses to their executive ranks after receiving a $5 billion payout from, from the federal government. I do also understand that, in fact, they've um, rescinded and or asking for those bonuses to be repaid, which is only proper. That aside, we as a community, a community of a million and a half people depend on our airport. We run 8 million passengers through there on a normal year. Uh, we are the fifth busiest. I honestly believe in, in another decade, we will be one of the top three busiest airports in Canada, simply because of our geographic location. Uh, don't forget, it's not only south that flights go, but we, we bring feeder flights in internationally and we feed the Northwest Territories 
and areas in northern Alberta, which are such as Fort McMurray, which are economic drivers of the entire country as well. Uh, there is a reason why, or probably multiple reasons, I suppose, why Calgary became the head office capital of Alberta and Edmonton not. I firmly believe that it is because of the status and standing of their airport versus Edmonton's airport. I don't know what happened historically to give Calgary an advantage over Edmonton, but they garnered it. And their airport is consequently far busier than ours. We need that airport to be busier. It drives the economy. There can be no doubt. There is zero doubt in my mind. I think as well, contrary to what was suggested by our presenters, that there would be a case, a case could be made for charging some sort of user fee for international flights to support international flights so that the carriers could in part be subsidized for their landing fees. I know people, for instance, that fly from Saskatoon to Southern California on an annual basis and all of them connect through Calgary. And I'm very confident without asking them that if we were to poll them, they would each be willing to pay some dollars more, 30, 40, 50 dollars more per flight to avoid the three and four and five hour layover that they must take in Calgary to extend their day or travel into a very long, tiring day. So is international travel um, important? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I could go on for another 20 minutes. I don't think I have to. I think our council has reached a decision and an understanding of the importance of it. And I'll, uh, I'll take a break and listen to the other comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Yes, um, thank you. I definitely will support this motion. Um, um, as I said before, I came in here thinking that I'm not too sure that um, this is something I'd like to support, but just hearing all the conversations that have happened, um, I really think it's something that's important. Um, I think it's really been proactive, you know, to mitigate the risks that could potentially be impactful to um, the economy in our region. Um, as, as has been mentioned, it's going to create 7,000 jobs. That's obviously will help induce um, the economy and seeing also how um, there's going to be a rapid growth in the region, 2.4 million in five years. We definitely will need an international airport that's running, up and running, you know. And although it's been said that there are no guarantees that we're going to lose um, the international airport status, but there are no guarantees that we will not lose lose it as well, you know, so I think it's just important to be proactive and, you know, put um, uh, processes and systems in place to ensure that, um, you know, these airlines come in and, the, you know, the international flights are there because it also, you know, helps with the quality of life, as we've heard um, with our residents. Um, although we might not see the direct impact, you know, in our community, but um, I think as a region, it's something that's important um, to support and I fully support this. Thank you, Councillor Harris, on discussion and debate. I'll support the motion. Uh, there is a saying that says, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And in this case, we will show leadership uh, following the city of Edmonton, which has already voted for this. I think we'll show leadership within the smaller or urban municipalities in this region. This is a good investment in our future. It's paid out um, based on a contractual um, uh, commitment from the airlines. And I think it's money that's well invested for the future, as Councillor Abatoy has just intimated. And I think that uh, that's what we're elected to do is to make decisions sometimes without knowing the eventuality of what might happen. But I think we've got enough information to support this thing going forward. So I will vote in support. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. I'll support the motion. Um, many comments been made already. I think uh, the big one for me is it's no secret that uh, airlines have suffered significantly, and with significant losses in in operations uh, over the course of COVID. And I'm not sure how many of them will be back to where they were before, but um, they're going to focus their operations on sites that will maximize the return on their cost of operating. So. Uh, this is this will be a big help locally here. I also believe that the international airport is a big piece uh, when people are considering 
relocating to, you know, to a region, an international airport for both people, for residences and businesses, an international airport is a, is a cornerstone to, uh, to our business and our residential communities. So, um, I will support the motion going forward. Thank you. Um, I'm going to support the motion as well. Um, you know, I think we have to remember a pandemic uh, is one in uh, 100 years. And uh, the we have never had an ask such as this before. So we've really never had to make a decision on this. Um, you know, Mr. Bruce uh, did indicate that they uh, engaged with the local chamber of commerces and that they did engage with the Alberta's industrial heartland uh, executive director as well to see if there was support for this uh, to make it a shared investment uh, because there is benefit to everybody uh, within the metro region and I do believe this is going to be a once in a lifetime ask and personally I believe our citizens uh, travel a lot internationally and uh, our heartland partners, our engineers, everybody uh, accesses that in, uh, airport. And I don't honestly believe the heavy lifting should only be to Edmonton. And I would hope that as some of the other um, mayors and councils you're listening to this, that this is truly a regionally significant, uh, regionally significant initiative and uh, that uh, we all have a part in pulling together um, to, uh, to keep this uh, airport um, sustainable so that we don't have to have multiple um, destinations if we're going to go international. So definitely um, I will support this. Uh, Councillor Lennox. Uh, just in regards to the, the chamber, um, it's my understanding that the chambers were consulted, but they haven't had time to consult their membership. So, as we are doing, they have done and making a unilateral decision um, for their their members. Um, is it a good investment? Probably. Uh, actually, I would probably say yes. Um, I have concerns over the accountability. I have concerns over the tr transparency. Um, and the lack of consultation. Um, I think about what $350,000 could have done to small businesses in our community, what $350,000 could do to nonprofit organizations in our community. Um, and I think that that needs to have at least a sober thought on how that money could have impacted um, businesses that were lost. In, in Fort Saskatchewan. So while I understand the regional perspective, I also think that it's important to remember um, our own community. So, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll go to uh, Councillor Macon to close. I think what's important to remember is what 350 dollars does do for our community. And, um, some of the statistics that they talk about this money bringing to our region and part of that is our community is 7,000 jobs, 485 million GDP, an additional 815 million, $19 million in wages, um, another increase um, in the ability to do cargo of about 70 million if I jotted that down correctly. So um, $354,000, yes, is an investment from our community, but I think that the return on investment is gonna be significant. And I think that uh, that is what we need to take to our residents uh, when they ask us about it. And um, the ones that I have talked to um, have supported this. So I'm happy to support this motion. Okay, thank you. So the motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. Your worship, I'm just waiting for Councillor Lennox.
Motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, I would suggest at this point in time, let's take a 10 minute break. Um, I think people are probably a little bit hungry and hopefully we can uh, get a little bite to eat within that time frame. So it's 726 now. So 740, how about? All right, so we will go in recess. Thank you.
Council would like to, Council and Administration would like to uh, start uh, rejoining us via your li live stream. We will start momentarily. Okay, it looks like we have everybody joining us. The next item that we have is roads and parking lot paving at West Rivers Edge. I believe that's Grant Schaefer presenting. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Just sharing my screen here. There we go. Um, good evening, Your Worship, members of Council. Uh, my name is Grant Schaefer. I'm Director of Fleet Facilities Engineering. And I'm here to present cost estimates for paving uh, the West River's Edge Road and parking lots. At the October 15th, 2021 Council meeting, Council directed administration to develop a business case for paving of West River's Edge. Um, even though River Valley Drive is a rural cross-section roadway with ditches, it is an improved road and therefore part of our pavement management program is identified in 2022 for reconstruction. The parking lots are not part of this program as they are gravel and paving them would be considered an improvement and therefore a new project. Uh, we did receive a geotechnical recommendation to ensure the best results for the improvements. Uh, the recommendation recommended that River Valley Drive uh, be reconstructed using a full depth, full depth reclamation technique where the existing surface and base are mixed together, reshaped, and recompacted into a new base material before being paved on top. This helps ensure any soft spots in the structure are reinforced and grading is improved prior to paving. Uh, the recommendation for the gravel parking lots is to grade them and then top them up with uh, base, top up the existing base, sorry, uh, before asphalt is placed on top. Estimates were, were prepared for the improvements based on recent tender prices. River Valley Drive is estimated at $340,000 and is slated to be complete with the 2022 local road rehab program. The 2021 budget for that program is 2.7. Um, the 2022 we're proposing uh, that that budget remain the same um, and we brought forward it, uh, for that approval um, during 2022 budget deliberations. Uh, the parking lot estimates range from $105,000 to $135,000. Um, the, the report presents two alternatives. Uh, the first is that council refer the projects to the 2022 budget deliberations. Uh, River Valley Drive would be included in the local road rehabilita rehabilitation project, and the parking lots would be included in a new project. The second alternative is that council amend the 2021 capital budget to complete the works this year. This would require approval of $715,000 funded from the capital projects reserve. If this were approved, uh, the plan would be to add this work to the current uh, road rehabilitation contract. However, at this time, it's unknown if the contract would be able to accommodate the additional scope within this construction season. Um, with that, the recommendation is that council um, refer the, the improvements to the 22, sorry, the 2022 capital budget deliberations, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I will go to uh, Councillor Kelly first. Thank you. One quick question, Grant. I think you said that even if the budget were approved now, that it's doubtful the work could be completed this summer. Um, your Worship, Councillor Kelly, I don't want to use the doubtful. I'm just not sure it could. Um, there's a scope of work increase that the contractor we run board would have to be able to accommodate. So I'm not sure if he'd be able to or not. What's the difference between not sure and doubtful? Um, certainty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Um, thank you. That was my only question, and and you caused doubt in my mind now as to what the correct course is. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Batoye. Questions. Thank you for your presentation, Brian. So, are these numbers based on um, any designs, or they're just estimates now, or they're just um, general estimates? 
Um, we worship the council of Toyota. They're based on the, the recommendations we got in terms of the work that needs to be done um, that we received from geotechnical. And then um, the areas of those specific areas multiplied by the unit rates we're seeing in uh, this year's tenders. So I guess the reason I'm asking that question is just because is how, how accurate is this? Are the numbers going to change when it comes back to budgets or are they like class five estimates? What are they? Um, there's a counselor, I would tell you, we consider these class two or better. Um, we have the info, we have bid prices from this year that these are based on. So we would uh, feel confident with these numbers for this year. Next year shouldn't change a, a whole bunch. There might be a few percentage points different. All right. Okay. Thank you, Grant. Excuse me. Uh, Councillor Harris, clarifying questions. Uh, well, I'm glad to see this report. I think I was the one that sponsored this thing coming back because I was pushing it, but uh, notwithstanding that, so the road itself is part of our normal pavement rehabilitation, and you're suggesting that it could conceivably be done this year, but that we have to have a bit more conversation with the contractor that's in town doing all the grinding and the pavement rehabilitation currently. Is that correct? Um, your worship, mm -hmm. Councilor Harris, and we would require funding for it because the 2.7 from this year's budget has been allocated to other roads. So we don't have the funding available in 21 to do this work. Okay. So did I miss you? I thought you were saying that, yeah, there was a possibility we could do it. Uh, your worship, Councilor Harris, we could, there's a possibility we could do it. We think we could probably add it to the contract, but we would need. Funding to be able to do it um, because we don't have the funding for the 2021 budget. Oh, okay. All right. So that's in my mind. I'm sorry. I'm slow. I'm, I'm a little confused there. I thought it could be done and that we had the money and it was part of the 2021 rehabilitation program. And you're saying you want to push it back to 2022 with new money for the parking lots, which aren't in the budget. Uh, your worship to Council Harris, I think that's what I said, but the, the, we don't have the funding this year, but we could put it in next year's program. It would be in next year's already based program, the road, and then the parking lots would be over and above. So what are you going to do this year for the potholes, the speed, the speed uh, control mechanisms in the pavement structure? What are you going to do about that? Uh, your worship to Council Harris, um, roads will be maintaining it for another year, pothole patching as required. So what commitment? Or are we going to have that this will get done next year? Um, your worship, the council Harris, it's in the it's in the program. Assuming that our program budget is approved again next year, it will be part of that program. Okay, thanks, Grant. <laughs> Just wanted to see where you're going with that. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation, Grant. Just uh, uh, I do support this project. I think it's it's overdue. I think it's a very well used uh, area of the city, see, and an all season area of the city. It's not just part of the year. I think it's all in the year. Just just curious. It's something that came up when I was reading this. Was do we ever use traffic counts to support a uh, uh, an investment like this or a venture like this? Um, your worship, Councilor Sperling, it is it is part of what we do. It Interesting you asked, we just counted it last week, just finished a count last week. Um, and there were, there was a significant traffic on there equivalent to some of our collector roads. So it is a significant, significantly well traveled roadway. Yeah, that's what I guessed. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just trying to think what's the questions. Um, actually, I don't have any, um, I guess the only other questions. So. So you're saying the road will be done in part of next year's budget? That's correct, yes. Okay. And then um so if we do the roads next year, then that 715 would be on top and, and uh asked for as additional monies. Um, Your Worship, we would the 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 road would be part of the 2.7 million dollar road rehabilitation ask. The parking lots would be the discussion and, and the projects we'd bring forward to see if what council's appetite was to pave the parking lots. And those come in at about 375,000 um, for the three parking lots. Okay. And uh, other than those parking lots, are there any other parking lots that are gonna have to get done in the city? Are those? Uh, they're, 
there may be, I think, um, your worship, we're looking at um, the warden's house, the, the loop in the warden's house in front of the warden house to clean that up and get that uh, um, brought back up to standard. But I'm not sure if we have any other major parking lots that are being done next year. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lennox, questions? Just in the in the report, it says a structure was also proposed for the existing gravel parking lots. What structure and who proposed? Um, it worship the Councillor Lennox. That was part of the geotechnical recommendations um, that we had. Um, so it was just to it's to add some additional gravel to those parking lots and then and then pave over top. Okay, that's all the questions. Thanks, Grant. Thank you, Councillor Macon. Thanks, Grant. I have no questions. Okay, thank you. So that will end questions. Councillor Kelly, would you like to put a motion on? Very much would, but I would like to ask one more question if I may first. Thank you. Um, this is perhaps better directed toward Mr. Fleming. <laughs> So, as I understood the comment, the River Valley Drive, that 340,000 would be part of, in the normal course of events, the normal road budget for next year, normal road capital, capital budget for next year, and the 375 would be budgeted separately this fall. Is there anything stopping council from taking the 340,000 from reserve and doing it this summer? River Valley Drive, and then reducing the roads budget next year by three hundred and forty thousand dollars to re reimburse the reserve for the, the money we would have spent anyways. <clears throat> Through your worship, there's nothing um, there's nothing stopping us from doing that. I believe that road rehab might be um, an operational program. Like we don't pull. We don't pull road rehab out of, but I, I get what you're saying is we take that road rehab money and put it to the reserve. Yes, we could do that. Yes, we could do that. Yes. Thank you. Then um, I believe there's an alternate motion that we not defer, but move it this year. And that's the one I'd like to move. Yes, I'll move that council amend the 2021 capital budget by creating a project to resurface River Valley Drive and the parking lots at West River's Edge. The project cost of $715,000 would be funded by the capital projects reserve and further that the amount of $340,000 be taken from next year's road improvement budget and allocated back to reserve to replenish the reserve it for the spending this year. So I'll let Ms. Exley work on the addition That's to up. that so that yes. can come up. While she's working on that, if you have any questions, Ms. Exley, when you're um, typing that up, just let me know. But you can go ahead and speak in favor of your motion. Yeah, I would. Um, the roads down there in the parking lots are not good. It's a heavily used recreational facility in Fort Saskatchewan. And as we saw last winter, really is turning out to be a 12 month facility. And the potholes and the bumps don't disappear in the wintertime. Um, if anything, they perhaps get worse. I'd like to move it up. I, I refer council or remind council of the rec study that we reviewed just recently. And the river valley and the, the pathway and the access to the pond and the skating, all of that area ranked number one in the study. And uh, I think it's time to do it. And, and whether we wait till 22 or do it in 21, the money is the same. We just get it ahead of time in perhaps a year when it might in fact cost less to do because the economy is still a bit slow. And, and that's my position. I, I welcome comments from the rest of council. Thank you. Thank you. So just before I go to discussion and debate, Ms. Exley, are you able to put the motion up so that Councillor Kelly can confirm the wording? Mr. Worship, can I get him to repeat that, please? Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> um, Cheryl, the motion was the same as given in the alternative two, with the exception of the last sentence I added. And that sentence was that the $340,000 withdrawn from reserves be budgeted to be replaced next year through a reduction or out of the road maintenance budget. 
however you wish to main word that, I think the understanding with administration is clear. Okay, I'm going to give her a moment and I know Mr. Fleming may run down to see her for a second, but we'll go on and uh, do discussion and debate. Uh, so, tr Mr. Fleming, you may have to uh, help Ms. Sexley with the wording, but we basically know what you're saying and we'll wait for the motion to come up, but we can get into discussion and debate. Okay. All right. So, it's being spoken in favor of and uh, Councillor Abatoye on the motion. Um, I think you um, you have some valid points, Councillor Kelly, but I know that um, when Mr. Schaefer spoke um, um, the spoke on the recommended um, motion, you talked about the risk of not completing that project this year. So what what risk um, what risk do we face if we pass this motion? Is that a question to myself or to Grant? So that that's to Grant. Uh, Your Worship, the Councillor Abatoy, there's no. I'd say there's no financial risk. Um, we just, when we talk to the contractor, we'll, we'll ex try and extend the pricing we have, negotiate that. Um, they are doing similar work for us. It's just how full they are. So it, we may have to come back and give an update to council to say we're, we can't get it done because of this, or we can only get this much of it done. But um, we'll have that commitment with a, with a contract that we can just roll into the next year if we have to. So, if we started the project this year and we're not able to complete it this year, what kind of impact does that have? Uh, Your Worship of Councillor, I would tell you, we wouldn't start the project um, unless we knew we could finish it. It's not right. a long duration project. The, the road work would take a week or two. It's just to make sure that they can start. It's just the. Is okay, so really, even if, even if we pass this motion, it's still dependent on the contractor if they are able to complete it or not, right? Um, that's correct, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Harris on the motion. I totally support it. And I thank Councillor Kelly for having the, uh, the foresight to see the value of doing it now because um, I've been pushing for this particular area to see some tender, loving care on that road. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And I was involved when we first built it. And the decision was made to go away from a gravel road to go to a cold mix road. And we reclaimed that uh, cold mix from the point of Pins Road. And I think that was a wise decision because it's a good base. <clears throat> there are undoubtedly some soft spots can undoubtedly be fixed and I would be surprised if the contractor can't get it done this year. I'd be really surprised. Um, they're in this for a buck and it makes sense for them to work hard to get things done. So I'd be surprised if they uh, didn't say, yeah, we'll do it. Uh, you're going to have to be a good negotiator grant to keep it at the unit prices. I look to you for good leadership in that regard, uh, but I fully support this motion and I think it is Makes a lot of a lot of sense. I initially didn't think that the um, parking lot at the at the boat launch or the overflow parking lot needed to be paved right away. Uh, the one at the pavilion definitely needs it because people are walking in and out of there all the time. And if we're going to rent that place, I think we need to rent it as a urban quality facility. And having that type of a parking lot makes sense. So if we can get it all done in accordance with Councillor Kelly's motion. Uh, that's a wonderful uh, decision. I think it shows good leadership going forward and good asset management uh, leadership to boot. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sperling on the motion. Um, you know, I think this roadway carries a lot of traffic and I think uh, as Councillor Harris mentioned too, it's, it, it really is overdue for a facelift. So um, I, I uh, will support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll support the motion as well. Uh, I really like the motion because really it's saying, well, we're going to do it next year, but we'll advance the uh, take take the money out now and we will pay it back next year. So at least by having that in the motion, uh, that is a commitment to put the money back in and uh, hopefully get the, the project done. And as everybody said, Mr. Schaefer, you'll have your challenge ahead of you, but we'll hope for a nice long uh, harvest time and, and good weather this fall. So um, uh, I'm good with this motion and uh, thank you, Councillor Kelly, for it. 
Councillor Lennox. I just um, have a question. So this was not like a done deal. Like this was going to be, according to the original motion, this was going to be part of the budget deliberations for 2022. It wasn't a done deal. Like council would have at that time had to deliberate on whether or not we wanted it to be part of the 2022 budget. Is that not correct? Um, your worship to Councillor Lennox, the road itself, we, we usually don't bring back individual roads as part of our road rehab program. So that part we would have as part of our normal course of um, work been doing that road. Anyway, the parking lots are the one piece that we would have brought back for deliberation at that time. Okay, because how many times is it? How many times has this road appeared in budget deliberations and been taken out by council? Uh, your worship the council Lennox, this road specifically, I don't know that it has. Was it the dog? Maybe the dog park road? Dog park road has, yes. Okay, so this one has never come before council then? No. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Macon. Um, I, you know, like I didn't have actually any problem with it coming to 2022 budget, uh, but there definitely seems to be support to move on this project sooner. So I'll support that also. Ask you a question that it just comes out of my complete ignorance for this subject matter. But how many meters of road would you say need to be paved for this project on River Valley Drive? Sorry, how many roads are being paved? How many so, meters of road do you think will need to be paved as part of this project on River Valley Drive? Oh shoot. <laughs> um I, I off the top of my head. Would you I say like remember. three to four hundred meters? Would that be I think it's actually longer than that. Okay. But it's it's, so in then, that, it's like five hundred meter range, yeah. So this question ties in to this one slash another motion that's coming for us tonight. Um, and again, strictly my ignorance on the subject matter. Why does paving this piece of road cost three hundred forty thousand, and three hundred meters of the road beside the hospital costs nearly one point nine million? Where is that? Where does that cost come from? Help me understand that. Like, and I know um, that there's more to the project by the hospital, but just help me understand the difference between these two. Um, so you're worshiping Councilor Macon. So River Valley Drive is taking the existing gravel road that's there, or Cold Mix Road, um, pulverizing it, acting it down, and putting asphalt on top. That's the complete scope of work. Um, 94th Street, um, there's no base there, so it's excavating it out. It's putting base in. It's putting in concrete curbs and median. Um, it's, a, it's a heftier bait or structure. There's more gravel. There's more asphalt. Different um, quality of road, is that right? Graham? It is a very different quality of road and different, different okay. purpose of it, yes. And, and okay. it just adds that much more to the scope. Okay, fair enough. Thanks a lot. I'll support the motion. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go. Uh, I don't think there's any additional questions. I'm going to go to Councillor Kelly for close, but I'm going to have the motion put up before we uh, before we formally close it. So uh, Ms. Exley, if you can put the motion up, and Councillor Kelly, you can confirm the wording, and then we'll go to close. Comfortable with the wording, Mary Catcher. Okay, thank you, Ms. Exley. All right, so I will go to you for close on the motion. Not a lot. Julie, can I ask a question? Because I'm oh. just seeing that motion. Pardon? Can I ask a question? I'm just, I just read the motion. I, okay. I didn't quite see it or hear it fully the first time. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering where the 349,000 came from. Like, why did we choose 349,000, Councilor Kelly? Bear with me one second. That information actually is 340,000. It's the River Valley drive amount, so good catch. Not 349, but 340,000. The amount that would be part of next year's road um, rehab anyway. Right, okay. 
Thanks for clarifying. Um, no, I fully support the motion. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Exley, can we just make sure that says 340,000? And then I'll have it pop up. You're good with that, Councillor Kelly? I am. Um, okay. okay. Thank you. All right. So you can go ahead and close on the motion. I think we have consensus, so I won't take a lot of time. The, the motivation is twofold. The road and the parking lots are not good. And it's a very heavily used recreational facility within the city. And, and um, given the experience of COVID, I think it makes sense to move on it. And I see Councillor Harris indicating something. Yeah, I'm not sure if the motion is correct because River Valley Drive is 340,000. And if you've got the parking lots in there, that adds that additional 300 and some odd thousand for a total of 715 in the report. And, so, and I, we, I was, it was my intention, Councillor Harris, based on Grant's comments, that the 340 would have been spent next year anyway as part of the road budget, the normal ongoing road rehab budget. So all I'm saying is let's do the road rehab this year and put it back into reserve next year. So at the end of next year, we're exactly where we would have been anyway with the road done one year early. Yeah, yeah but the 300 and some odd thousand for the parking lots, if the parking lots are in your motion is new, those, those are new projects. Okay, uh, so yeah. I'm gonna go back to Miss Exley. I don't, I need to read the motion again because yeah. it needs to have the council amend the 2021 capital budget. So it needs that full, uh, second option in there, and then with that balance amount. Like, I'm not speaking against it. I just want to make sure that we're clear because the parking lots are not part of the 340. It's additional to do the parking lots. Your Worship, perhaps what we would do then is um, <clears throat> what we need to do is approve the entire 715,000 and then alloc and then allocate back the 340. That That would probably work. Yeah. Okay. I, I would consider that an editorial change. I'm I'm good with that, obviously. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so Mr. Fleming, do you want to make that editorial change on there? Are you able to do that? I can't do it, but um we'll get it done and we'll we'll make sure that we reconfirm that the wording with council, but um or Miss Exley can do it now. Just I think what we were missing in that motion is we we have to approve the whole amount and then we have to make sure that that we reallocate that 340,000 back and we were just missing the 715 originally so we'll get that in yeah okay okay is councillor uh is council do you want to, okay just a second here we'll wait for this Oops. i think that covers it okay i think that covers it Councillor Kelly, I just need to ensure you're comfortable with it. I'm comfortable with this as well, subject to to other editorial changes that fellow councils might councillors might note. Okay, so um, given given none, I don't have much to close. I think it's just would be nice to get it done this year, and I think council agrees, so it's callable. Okay, thank you. So the motion is now closed as uh, presented. Please cast your vote. That is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grant. Uh, the next one is uh, item 8.294 street widening phase one, class two estimate costs, Joey Farbrother and Grant Schaefer presenting. Okay, thank you. All right, so hopefully everyone can see that. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, members of council. My name is Joey Fairbrother, 
and I'm the manager of engineering and fleet facilities and engineering department. I'm here to present the class two budget and, um, and request a decision from council to proceed with the construction of capital project 21033 94th street winding phase one. So 94th Street is an arterial road in, south, in the Southport area that runs between the hospital and the existing subdivisions of South Point and Siena. 94th Street will be a divided four lane road from Southport Drive to the newly constructed roundabout at Siena Boulevard and South Point Boulevard. Phase one of the widening will construct two additional lanes, curb and gutter, center median with turn lanes, a two meter separate walk, street lights, and boulevard landscaping from the entrance of the hospital to the south to south of the existing Clio condominium site. On October 1st, 2020, the 94th Street Widening Capital Project was presented to Council as part of the 2021 budget deliberations. Council provided or Council approved the budget of $650,000 based on a class five estimate. A consultant has been hired and has completed detailed design drawings and has provided the class two cost estimate based on these drawings. As per the operating and capital budget policy, city administration is bringing back the class two cost estimate. There's a large discrepancy between the class five estimate and the class two estimate. The class five cost estimate was based on the 2017 Southport Drive widening project and the cost estimate that is in the Southport offsite levy bylaw. So for example, the widening in 2017 of Southport Drive was a similar scope of work and it cost approximately $2,200 per meter. The current class two estimate for 94th Street as the work costing approximately $6,200 per meter, so almost three times as much. Um, some reasons for this may be due to the shorter length of the project compared to Southport Drive. When we widened Southport Drive in 2017, that was about 1.7 kilometers. Um, this section of Southport Drive is only about 350 um, meters. So if this project moves forward, it will increase the accessibility and walkability to the existing developments to the west. There are existing condominiums that have temporary vehicle access and houses that front 94th Street that have no sidewalk accessibility. There is also a new assisted living facility that is being built just north of the existing condominiums. So the project is funded from the Southport offsite levy. Um, currently, there is an uncommitted balance of 1,514,000. Um, the previously approved 650,000 has already been committed from the levy. The city expects an additional 225,000 in contributions to the levy prior to the end of June. The Southport offsite levy will be updated in 2022 to capture the cost of this project. It is expected that the levy will increase by $10,000 per hectare. A $7,740 operating impact was approved with the 2021 budget deliberations. No additional operate, operating impacts are anticipated. So the recommendation is that council approve the construction budget for capital project 21033 94th Street widening phase one by increasing the project budget by 1,220,000 to be funded by the Southport offsite levy. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm hoping it's your computer that's, does anybody else see all that black and white? Yes, so your computer is uh, giving us a real show on here. <laughs> But uh, all right, so we will go to questions first. Councillor Abatoye. Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation, Joey. And nice photo, by the way. Um, so first of all, my first question is why, um, so offsite levies are usually put set aside for, I mean, um, for projects like, I mean, um, road constructions, et cetera. Why is this coming to council for approval to fund, um, to fund this project, seeing that it's, can you put on your screen? Cause it's really, it's really I will, I'm sorry, I lost, the, uh, I lost the WebEx meeting here. No, I apologize. I, for some reason I can't, uh, I only have a small screen. You can't stop the screen share. Oh, here we go. I apologize. It's over there. Okay, much better. Sorry. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right, I'll go back to Councillor Abatoye. Go ahead. 
Thank you for your presentation, Joey. Um, so my first question is, um, so offsite levies, they usually set aside for um, projects such as, you know, road, con road construction. And I'm wondering why we come into council to ask for approval for this. Um, so Councillor Abitoya, um, it, it's just part of the capital project, right? Even though it's funded from a levy, it's still a capital project that, that needs approval from council. So so is, is it all projects that that's we fund through the offsite levies that, are, that come through council? That's correct. Yeah, that's typical. Oh, yeah. really? Okay. 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 That's good to know. Um, so your presentation says that um, the um, levies are going going up by ten thousand per hectare from going forward. What what's the levies right now? Sure. So the current levy for Southport is one hundred and four thousand um, dollars per hectare. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Councillor Harris. Questions. I have no questions. I think this is a straightforward project and it's uh, part of our normal build. So I have no questions. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation, Joy. I just have one question. I'm just kind of uh, uh, challenged with the change in the in the amount of this project. It went from 650,000 based on a class five and now we're up to a million eight seventy based on a class two. And I know the difference in the classes of the estimates. Um, so did the scope of work change on this? Has there been a significant change or is it simply the fact that we did a class five versus a class two estimate? Yes. So Councillor Sperling, no, no, the scope of work didn't change. The I would say it increased a little bit maybe by you know, I think we have regionally said that it was 300 meters in length. It's about 350 to 400 now that you include the taper. I mean, that's not a big increase, but um, the scope was the same. We, when we brought it back, it was still for, for the additional two lanes, the sidewalk, you know, the street lighting and the boulevard. It, it really just came down to the unit rates that we used to, to class five. Um, I guess I've changed significantly from what we saw back in 2017 and what was provided in, in the, uh, the estimate in the offsite levy. So this original estimate came from 2017. Well, we were using those unit rates that we had saw in 2017 okay. because it was a, a fair enough. Of work. Okay, fair enough. I was just thinking, you know, what if it was a one year difference, I would have thought, uh, you know, if we were looking at this last year to build this year, it would have been probably prudent to look at a class two estimate originally, just so that we had the number uh, fairly firm to do that. You know, to include in the budget, but if the original number came from 2017, I understand. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking at the map that you've got attached to here, and uh, you have some wording on their assisted living building. So, uh, is that part of the reason also why this is, needs to go forward this year? So, to the mayor catcher, when we originally brought the project, that assisted that assisted living building wasn't um, being built or proposed. It, it is a benefit of it now that there is development there. The widening of that road will help out with accessibility and walkability in front of that building. Um, but that the Clio oh. condominiums were there originally. That kind of drove the the project originally. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lennox. Uh, I don't have any other questions. My question was around the difference in the, the estimate. So asked and answered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Macon. Not surprisingly, my question was also about the difference in the estimate. And I guess if uh, wood is tripled in price, then it should be uh, no surprise that other things have tripled in price also. So no, no, no questions. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Yeah, I think all of council would have had a question on the, the difference in pricing. Um, the primary driver of the cost of asphalt, though, is is the cost of oil, bunker crude, and and that has not skyrocketed in price. In fact, it's gone up, but not much in the last couple of years. The difference is so large; it causes me concern. I, I'm I'm not comfortable with the explanations that we've been given. Are we certain that, that we're getting competitive pricing on this? It just, I, I, I'm struggling with, with that sort of price increase in a five year period. When, when the, I know that the cost of the petroleum product has not changed. No, so to Councillor Kelly, no, 
understand, and I guess I would say that this is still just, just an estimate, right? So um, we haven't received tender prices and, and we're not sure, you know, hopefully the tender prices that we get will come in more competitive than, than the estimate. This is a class two estimate that our consultant has put together based on the, the detailed design drawings to this point, so. Okay, thank you, Joy. I, let's hope it comes in lower. So one follow-up question with reference to the um, offsite levy reserve for South Fork, this will bring it down to $225,000. Are you, is administration comfortable that that levy with the money is yet to be received due to com through completion of development will be sufficient to do what we have to do as a city down there? Yes, so we have an additional, we expect with the development agreements that we've seen, we expect an additional 225,000 this year. And the way the development agreements work um, for what we've seen this year in the Southport area, they're only contributing 50%. So we expect the, the second payments in the second 50% next year to be $750,000 of, because that's what we've seen this year with the original 50% payments that developers have seen. And that total money won't get us paid down to to, to the traffic circle. So back to my original question, is that levy going to, and the levy program going to see us through successful completion of so forth? Um, Your Worship, if I could try and answer that one. Um, Your Worship, Councillor Kelly. Um, so the, the plan this fall is, is once we have tender prices on this project is to update that levy, um, the levy amounts and go through and recalculate what that levy needs to be to take it all the way through um, just based on time it'll come back in early 22 before we get all the processes in place but it'll be in place for the 22 construction season um, so with the recalculation um, it'll take into account the, the current pricing we're seeing um, the re new estimates on the projects that are remaining um, so that the the levy funds are built up to to ensure that we can do the work that we need to do okay thank you grant i uh, appreciate the comment okay thank you Councillor Abatoye, would you like to put the motion on? Yes, I'll make a motion that Council approves the construction budgets for capital projects 21033 um, 94th Street widening phase one by increasing the project budgets by 1.22 million to be funded by Southport offsite levy. Okay, thank you. I'll accept the motion. Would you like to speak in favor of it? Yeah, no, I think, um, um, first of all, I'm just thinking um, if we're going to be widening, that's, um, that's so if we're going from two lanes, two lanes to four lanes, that seems like a, a big scope of work. And so I'm not too surprised with the increase in the price. Um, but I mean, um, we talked about this um, assisted living that's going to be going in there, you know, and this um, road widening is going to help with um, accessibility and walkability for um, the potential residents that are going to be there. So I think it's um, it's a great project that's um, that we definitely um, should support. Agreed for. Okay. Thank you. Somebody's not on mute. Um, go into discussion and debate. Councillor Harris, you're first. I'll support the motion. Uh, this is just uh, the ongoing, I guess, cost and requirement uh, to sustain growth in our community. And, uh, you know, it's part of the overall estimate of infrastructure expansion over time. So, um, you know, obviously there's been uh, changes in unit cost pricing over time. And uh, I guess our engineering department do the best job they can trying to estimate these projects going forward. But uh, I think this is uh, uh, appropriate to do at this point in time. And so I'll support uh, the motion. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sperling. Yes, I'm going to support the motion too. I think it's uh, obviously a road that needs to be built as a four laner and uh, something that uh, will be uh, of value to all of the residents in that area. So. I'm sure they'll welcome the upgrade, deal with the pain of the construction, and they'll welcome the upgrade in the in the short term. So, uh, I will support the motion. Okay, thank you. I'll also support the motion and just go back to this is why we have offsite levies. This is why we review them on a constant basis to ensure that we do have sufficient 
uh, funds going forward and to get these projects done. So um, that's the benefit of uh, having good planning and engineering and uh, setting these offsite levies up. So absolutely, I'll support it and I think it will be a benefit. And uh, I like what's showing on the map. Thank you. Councillor Lennox. I have nothing to add and I will support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Macon. I have no comments, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Just one follow-up question to administration based on earlier comments. It was suggested that perhaps part of the reason for the difference in the per unit pricing was the, the length of the road. In other words, if we, the unit price would come down if we did a longer stretch. Um, would it be possible to get two prices? To see if, in fact, that is the case, because if there's a significant difference in the per meter cost for a longer stretch of road, I don't know why we would build this out in shorter chunks as opposed to doing it in one fell swoop. And um, now I know this is off site levy and, and it's not officially city money, it's developer money, but it's not developer money. That's money that's paid for and passed on to new home buyers in the community. So it, it behooves us to be as efficient as possible. Uh, is it possible to, to get a quote to take it down to say the traffic circle? Because we know we're going to do it anyway. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so to Councillor Kelly, um, a few issues with that. Um, one that adding that much stretch of, of length, we probably would not have the sufficient funds in the levy currently to do the whole stretch down to the roundabout. Um, you would also have to um, start design we haven't designed down to the roundabout which is a, a quite a longer section um, and then you don't know where the access is necessarily are going to be for the um, development to the west and then i guess one of the last issues would be that the right of way has not been um, provided to the city as you go further south from the storm pond in sienna so that hasn't been dedicated to the city yet for, because there hasn't been that development in south point so so there's a few issues with going there i agree that you'd probably get uh, better unit rates um, for a longer stretch, but it just wasn't feasible to look at that stretch at this time. We want to do it. We don't have it. Okay, thank you. You are freezing up, Councillor Kelly. All right, so we'll go to Councillor Abatoye to close, and hopefully Councillor Kelly will be able to rejoin us. Uh, nothing on close. Okay, I just need to make sure that Councillor Kelly is back. Councillor Kelly, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Are you able to, your, your screen is frozen. You've got your yellow triangle. The yellow triangle curse of death. Okay, Councillor Kelly, I don't know. Can you hear me or not? Oh, here we go. Nope. Okay, we do have to be respectful with technology and we are going to uh, wait for him to uh, try and get back on and rejoin us. There he is. Okay. Okay, I think we have everybody back again. All right, thank you. So Councillor Abatoye had nothing further on close. So the motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. Sorry, Your Worship. Yeah, technology seems to be quite slow this evening. Just need a uh, Councillor Abatoy if she's in favor or opposed. Favor. OK, 
Okay, that motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, the uh, next item that we have is Capital Region Northeast Water, Service, uh, Water Services Commission membership. Janelle Smith Dugan. Can I ask for a break before we start this, Mary Catcher? Yeah, we certainly can. It's 829. Um, I'm going to suggest 10 minutes. I think uh, 10 is good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 8, 840. Okay. Thank you. We are in recess.
Everybody would like to start rejoining us. We will begin momentarily. Hey, Councillor Macon, are you able to join us on your video? Okay, there we go. All right, we have everybody back. So the next item is Capital Region Northeast Water Services Commission membership. Janelle Smith do good presenting. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. The Capital Region Northeast Water Services Commission is proposing significant changes to their bylaws. The proposed changes limit an existing member's municipality's autonomy in managing its water source and ability to withdraw from the commission. The City of Fort Saskatchewan has raised concerns with the current governance and operations of the Water Commission. Given the, given the potential loss of autonomy regarding ongoing membership and previously raised concerns, Administration is requesting a decision from Council regarding ongoing membership with the Capital Region Northeast Water Services Commission. Should Council approve the motion included in the report, Administration will provide notice of intent to withdraw in 10 years. The duration is intended to provide ample time for the City and the Commission to adjust current operations. In the meantime, Port Saskatchewan is open to working with the Commission to evolve the rate structure, voting structure, and bylaws. Port Saskatchewan believes in collaboration with regional partners and is committed to finding a solution that works for both the region and Fort Saskatchewan. At this point, I am happy to answer any questions that Council may have. And also of note, Brad McDonald and Richard Kenyon from Public Works are available to answer questions as well. Okay, thank you. So we'll only deal with uh, questions at this point in time. Councillor Harris, you're first. I've been in the middle of this, and so I really have no questions. I think the report speaks for itself, um, and I'm sure uh, our administration can answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sperling? I have no questions, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I don't have any questions. I'll have some comments when we get to debate. Councillor Lennox? I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Macon. I also don't have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. Uh, question of admin. If we give the notice tonight or if we pass this resolution, that does not prohibit us, and there's nothing in the bylaws of the Water Commission the proposed bylaws, I should say, that, that would prohibit Fort Saskatchewan from continuing its search for a second water source of water outside of the commission? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, no, nothing that I've observed. Uh, members of the commission board concur with that response? That would be my assessment, Councillor uh, Kelly. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Abitoye, clarifying questions? I actually have no questions. Janelle. Okay, thank you. So, um, Councillor Harris, you're on for a motion, if you like. Um, I do so this with trepidation and with reluctance, but I believe the time has arrived for revolutionary, not evolutionary change with uh, our membership in the Commission. So I would therefore, with that initial comment, make the following motion that council direct our administration to provide notice to the Capital Region Northeast Water Service Commission uh, of the city of Fort Saskatchewan's intention to withdraw from the commission in 10 years. Okay, I'll accept the motion. You can speak in favor of your motion. Uh, Councillor um, 
Abatoya and I are currently uh, the sitting members uh, representing the city of Fort Saskatchewan <clears throat> on the Water Commission board. Uh, Councillor Kelly uh, did it for two and a half to three years, and I think he uh, did uh, a great job representing our interests to a group of people that just don't listen to what's going on. And they're not aware of the concerns that we have about the structure and the financing and the operation to a lesser degree of the uh, water commission and the latest straw that or the, the latest straw that is breaking the camel's back in my opinion personally is that the um, <clears throat> the some of the members of Saturn and hoc committee that have drafted some draft bylaws that we have to as a result of the red tape reduction initiative of the provincial government and those bylaws there's five bylaws four of them are fine but the fifth of the bylaw, which is as appropriately discussed in the um, in the report, is totally unacceptable to the city of Fort Saskatchewan. I am a very str a str strident um, uh, supporter of regional uh, cooperation, in particular the Water Commission. I served as the commission manager when I worked for the city for a number of years uh, before I left the city in 2005. So I. I, I understand the operation of Water Commission uh, flat down, um, but I don't agree with the direction that some of our members have taken. And I think that we need to continue to have discussions with the members to reach a better and more equitable relationship for all members, and in particular, the city of Fort Saskatchewan, which we represent. We are the largest consumer of water in the commission and we are by far getting the worst deal. And that needs to change. And so by uh, passing this motion, I think we will send um, a very clear message to our commission colleagues that the time for change has arrived and it will not go on any longer. We need to reach a new understanding of how to make this commission function in a better manner. And so I put this motion on the table again, I say reluctantly, because I wish we could work with our colleagues to achieve equity. It is not equitable. It needs to change. Okay, thank you. I'll accept the motion. It has been spoke, uh, spoken in favor of. It is open for discussion and debate. Councillor Sperling, you're next. Yes, yeah, so, uh, I'll support the motion. Um, Councillors Harris and Abatoy are our are, are representatives to the Water Commission at the present time, and I believe uh, Councillor Harris has articulated our position at the moment and the challenges we face as a as a community and a member of that commission right now. So um, I will support the opportunity to look for an alternative source if that's if that's out there and a better deal for our city and residents. That's uh, I very much support that research. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll also reluctantly support the motion. Um, you know, I've uh, worked on a lot of boards and commissions, and uh, a lot of us have had to redo some of our bylaws because of the red tape reduction. But never have I seen a um, a board. Uh, put such blocks up for any of their member municipalities. I mean, there has to be proper exit strategies if somebody chooses to. And when you're a 60% user of the water supply, you know, it's very important that they do listen to, you know, their members. And uh, it's very disappointing to hear what's going on. But I do commend Councillor Abatoye and Councillor Harris on the negotiations that they are having. And it's just frustrating uh, with the reluctance and the barriers that they're running up against. So, you know what? This does serve notice that uh, you're absolutely right. It is time for change and it's time that um, the board need to listen to the city of Fort Saskatchewan. So I will support this. And I do thank Councillor Abatoye and Harris. Thank you. Councillor Lennox. I do have a question um, for uh, Janelle. Um, it says in the report that over the past three years, the city contributed 11.3 million to the commission with a net uh, revenue contribution uh, of 4.7 million. Can you 
just for the public, can you translate that into how much um, per cubic meter Port Saskatchewan residents have been paying over that period of time extra in order to support the reserves for the commission? Uh, through your worship, you Councillor Lennox. So currently with our existing water rate, uh, 0.7275 dollars goes to the Capital Region North Northeast Water Service Commission. So how can you maybe simplify that just a little bit and um, give people an understanding of, of I guess why this came to our attention in the first place? It was because, and from my perspective, that um, for Saskatchewan residents were paying uh, above and beyond um, for their water, um, and so I'm just wondering if it's if you're able to quantify that. Was it ten cents? Per cubic more, or are you able to quantify that? Um, no, I don't know if I am able to break it down based on how much goes into the reserves. An initial conversation we had it was about front ending future growth and whether or not that should be the responsibility of the commission or of the municipality. Those conversations have been resolved, but from our additional investigation into the current operations, it came to light that. We have concerns. We've been working to try to address those concerns, but we are at a decision point given that the bylaws are coming forward. Okay, and I, I agree. I think um, I think it's just disappointing that we weren't able to sway. I guess some of the other municipalities as far as um, seeing what our perspective was and what our challenges are. Um, and um it's unfortunate that it's come to this but uh, i do also support the motion to uh to leave the commission so thank you thank you councillor macon thank you i will support the motion um it appears that their bylaws do not have the best interest of all members and um I think that this will show that the city of Port Saskatchewan is serious so finding an option for our users. I'd like to thank Councillor Harris, Abatoy, and previously Councillor Kelly for their work to get a fair deal for Port Saskatchewan. And I truly hope that this will encourage real change and real conversation with members of the commission um, before the 10 years is up. So but I will support this motion. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. Uh, as referenced by Councillor Harris, I sat on the Water Board Commission, Water Commission for three years, three full, three full years. Um, at that particular point in time, I knew that I did not support the mandate of the commission anymore. I could not be an effective board member. And I asked Councillor Harris if he would swap me his wastewater role for my water commission role, and he generously accepted, and I thank him for that. I think both Harris and, and Abatoy have done a great job over the last almost a year. I do not, though, support the optimism. I spent three years on that board. As it sits right now, Fort Saskatchewan, if we could, as opposed to buying our water directly from EPCOR, at what, at what the other municipalities pay, Fort Saskatchewan is paying 73%, 73% more for each cube of water. That works out to very close to $1,600,000 per annum of additional operating costs passed to our citizens through utility rates. On top of that, we have a commission that now thinks, based on the new bylaws, that each member, each member of the committee, each council, each municipality, some of which are as small as 1,500 residents, should have a veto vote on what Fort Saskatchewan, what Fort Saskatchewan can do as part of the commission and whether or not we can choose to leave in the future. A veto vote. That's what the changes mean. This at the same time as our council passed the resolution to send a letter expressing our concerns with the draft bylaws 
when it only required a two third vote. Completely ignored, now a veto vote. I see that lasting indefinitely. It's possible they could change. Um, capital costs going forward. Port Saskatchewan needs approximately 11 kilometers of water line to have a second source of water. I don't care if it's 12 or 13, it doesn't matter. It might only be eight. The fact is that $1.6 million per annum in water savings will recover a $7.5 million cost in under five years. This on a water line that would be expected to last 100 years. We get then a 20% return on that investment with our savings. And at the end of five years, that cost is paid for. That's $1.6 million per annum that would, and this is at current population levels, by the way, and we expect to grow. That's $1.6 million per annum that would stay within our community. Every year, every 10 years, fellow councillors, that's $16 million. Let me put it another way. $1.6 million per annum would fund a debenture of approximately today's interest rates, while at about 3%, a debenture of about $25 million. That's one half of a new swimming pool of $50 million every year that we spend just on water. If we own our own line, if we own our own source of supply, we put up the capital money, we are then 100% in charge of what happens. We don't have to negotiate with the board. We don't have to talk to a board. We are 100% responsible. Under the current water rate structure with the Water Commission, there's no capital charge. It's all based on a variable rate. So at, at, at being the most significant consumer, Fort Saskatchewan is on the hook for approximately 60% of future capital replacement costs on approximately 200 kilometers of line. Those lines aren't going to break, I don't think, in the next decade, perhaps not in the next two decades. I don't know. Some of them are approaching 40 to 50 years old, though. Nonetheless, 60% responsible going forward for 200 kilometers of line versus a five-year payout, and we have no further, no further obligation to a water line and money staying in our community forever. Um, Administration did a great job looking at some of the new bylaws set up by other water commissions. Our water commission stands alone in its approach to its proposed bylaws. No other commission, no other commission gives every community a veto vote over the actions of a member, only ours. Other commissions also say that if a member leaves, that member will be reimbursed by the commission if in fact the, 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 the capacity funded by that leaving member is subsequently used by the commission. Furthermore, that leaving member has the option to sell that capacity to a new member or another member if, if the chance or option arises. None of those options are available in our proposed bylaws. Further, our proposed bylaws, contrary to what other commissions have in their bylaws, our proposed bylaw still doesn't propose to change the rate structure. There should be a capital component to the rate, and there should be a variable component to the rate. The water line is fixed, that's capital. The purchase of water, that's variable. Other commission structures allow for that to happen. Not our commission, our commission strictly variable. Why? because it suits some of the members, straight and simple. The purpose of the commission, the purpose of the commission is to purchase water from EPCOR, run it down a water line, maintain that water line, and sell the water to its members. Mark the price of the water up to cover its operating costs and its capital costs. It's that simple, supply water. The commission continues to operate and continues to supply water, whether or not Fort Saskatchewan is a member of it. The commission survives. What does change is probably the future cost to the surviving members because now they're going to have to pay a rate that more accurately represents their, com their consumption, what it costs to deliver the water to them. That's what will change. 
And that is what the argument is about. It's not the survivability of the commission. It's one community picking on another community. Sorry, but that's the way I see it and that's the way it is. And that's why I could no longer be on the board. I thank the current board members for their duty or pardon me for their service. They've done a great job. I could not support the commission after three years. I do not think Fort Saskatchewan belongs in the commission. The most important chore for Fort Saskatchewan in the next few years is securing an alternate source of water so that we can stop the financial bleeding. It's that simple. Straight and simple. No further discussion needed in my mind. And I thank you both, all of you, for listening to my comments. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Hey, um, I fully support the motion. Um, the way I see this is 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 um, the way I see it is just one of two ways. Is either the issues, the Fort Saskatchewan concerns are addressed, or we leave. It's that simple. Um, and I'm taking a stand as a city councillor, uh, as a councillor in Fort Saskatchewan, because um, I became a director of the um, commission um, and, uh, towards the end of 2019. So I think October 2019. And from the very first meeting I attended, I saw very clearly how Fort Saskatchewan was was disadvantaged. We had we we, we had a disadvantaged position from the very first day um, I attended the meeting, despite the fact that we're the largest member. Um, as you heard all the numbers that uh, Councillor Kelly mentioned, um, and largest member, but really the least, we got the least benefits compared to every other member. You know, and so when the regulations um, that's um, that's uh, when the regulations that's um, regulated us where we send it and we had to um, do bylaws. I, I put my name forward to be on the subcommittee because I thought this was something that was very important for us um, as a city. Um, and although we made some progress, um, I mean, we had a number of concerns and, uh, and some progress were made. I wouldn't deny um, certain things were changed. Um, but for me, the, the, the latest one, which was a big slap in the face, Despite we had said that, look, we have a concern with, um, you know, the two thirds, uh, but now coming back and saying you, you, you no longer have autonomy, your destiny is in the hands of five other municipalities, not the directors. So and essentially, they're going to be going back to their councils and voting and saying, oh, can you go or not? I, I think that's absolutely unacceptable. Um, and so the truth, the matter is, like I said, it's either two, it's either one of two, it's either our concerns are addressed or, or we leave. Um, I also, I, I, like, I don't think the commission is fair for the commission to be tying, um, tying, um, the hands of the city and, you know, um, we, you can't win both ways, you know, so, and also if, if this, if the commission isn't going to listen to the issues that, um, the concerns that Fort Saskatchewan has mentioned, it's that simple. Let the cost be equally shared, so that way there will be no oh, you know, for Saskatchewan needs to get, you know get some sort of advantage because of um you know how much um contribution we are making to the commission, you know. So right now there's three major issues. It's the autonomy that's being taken away. It's the rate structure. It's the voting structure. These are the three major concerns that um the city of Fort Saskatchewan has, you know, that needs to be addressed by the commission, you know. So. As we said, it's either the concerns are addressed or um, we have to exceed the commission. So I fully support this motion. I think it's we're sending the message um, that you know this is a conversation the board has to has to have, you know, because um, these conversations have been you know pushed aside for the longest time. So it's about time that we you know sat up and you know had the tough conversations. And I think I'm ready to have those conversations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Councillor Harris on close. I think each uh, Dr. Kelly had uh, another question or a comment uh, before I close. Sorry, Councilor Harris. Yes, if you don't mind, please. Okay, okay I'm just going to ask uh, if we need to go through the rotation or is everybody just good with uh, going to Councilor Kelly? Okay, you're good. Go ahead. Councilor Kelly. I'm told by a source that I trust that the commission manager has used his post on the water buying group and his associations with EPCOR to actively promote, actively engage EPCOR to convince them, lobby EPCOR is the word, I guess, to convince them 
that Fort Saskatchewan should not be allowed to buy water directly from EPCOR. We've seen signs of that as we have talked to EPCOR about a secondary water source. Uh, quite frankly, I find that offensive. This council should find that offensive. This community should find that offensive. I'd like to, I wish I should say, I wish I could support the comments that if we could just change some of the bylaws that we would be good to go. Uh, I can't imagine what could change in the bylaws that would give Fort Saskatchewan the autonomy that we would have and the luxury of that autonomy that we would have if we owned our own water line. So while I support the work of the two councillors on the on the board, and, I, and and with all respect, I truly do, because I know it's not easy. I am extremely, in fact, I'll tell you 100% pessimistic on the outcome. I cannot envision any changes to the bylaw that would make being a member of the commission worthwhile. From a capital cost, from a liability, from an aggravation, from a control your own destiny as a city perspective, there's nothing that the changes could not happen substantially enough to make it worthwhile. And thank you for the time to speak again, Councillor Harris. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Harris for close. In counterpoint to uh, Councillor um, Kelly's uh, comments, and I appreciate them wholeheartedly, I am more of an optimist. Um, I am committed to a regional model. Uh, having been the manager for a number of years, I saw how it worked really quite well. Over a period of growth, the city of Fort Saskatchewan has grown substantially, and ultimately that has created part of the challenge with our rates. Uh, we buy raw water at uh, about a dollar six uh, cubic meter, and uh, we sell it to our customers for about a dollar sixty four per meter. Is that correct, uh, Bradley? Is it, are those the correct numbers? Uh, based on the 2021 uh, inflationary increase, the uh, they, the commission resells to the communities at about the dollar seventy three. Okay, dollar seventy three. So. Yeah, so there's there's a huge overhead been added to that in the name of capital rehabilitation. And one of the things that I think we need to do going forward in, in addition to getting better bylaws, better voting structure, a lot of different things, that time has arrived. Um, we need to ultimately, or the commission needs to have a comprehensive asset management plan, which shows how it is uh, funded and who draws benefit from it to achieve, I guess, what Councillor Kelly was talking about. And that is to ensure that there is a variable rate that covers operating costs and there is a community-based cost for capital. Now, would that have a significant impact on some of the smaller members? It would, but we should all pay what we essentially draw benefit from. Uh, Councillor Abitoye and I will be participating in a special board meeting on uh, June the 14th, at which time the members will consider just the five bylaws that we have to update to conform with the provincial red tape production strategy. And four of them we're fine with uh, in general terms, the fifth one we're not, as we mentioned earlier. And uh, I'm hoping that the back channel discussions that I've had with some members will give some credence to the fact that that I personally, and I believe Councillor Abitoye, and I think most members of council are supportive of the regional model, as long as we're not paying the full share. I had a, a chat with a former uh, chairman who said, oh yeah, we all pay the same uniform rate, but yeah, we pay the same uniform rate, but we're paying a lot more for everything. And that's gotta end. We need equitable bylaws. We need an equitable voting structure. We need an equitable uh, revenue and uh, rate base. Is that possible? Uh, I, I think so. We we do have some very competent people on the board representing their municipalities. Uh, I think they uh, will hopefully now uh, sit up and take better notice than they have when Councillor Kelly was trying to uh, push the issues that were important to him at the day that are still important today. 
And I think this motion is a shot across the bow and it's a shot across the bow to get people to wake up. Um, if we have to pull away and find our own, mo our, our own water supply with another municipality or directly from Epcor, we will do it. We can do it. I will ensure that we do it as a board member and as a councillor, and I'm sure each one of you feel the same way. We've got to represent the interests of our community in the best way we can. And um, I say, I say that I say make those comments with guarded optimism that we can have a fruitful discussion because it's time for revolutionary change, not evolutionary change. And so um, I'm hoping the discussions we have uh, on the 14th are fruitful, and uh, I will be looking for at least that fifth bylaw to be uh, deferred, to refer, to have further conversation and discussion around these matters. And quite frankly, I think we need to apply to the province for an extension of the, dead, dead, the September 1st deadline for approval of these bylaws. And so that is my comments to the public and to the other members of the commission uh, that the time for change has arrived. And it's not if, but when. And so that's where I'm coming from on this. I, I didn't really want to be the one to introduce this motion but I definitely will support it. And those are my closing comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Macon is trying to reconnect. We're having some uh, visual problems. She said she can hear people, but uh, she can't get her uh, visual on there. So we do have uh, the motion that is closed at Council Direct Administration to provide notice to the Capital Region Northeast Water Services Commission of the City of Fort Saskatchewan's intent to withdraw from the commission in 10 years. Okay, so if you can put that down so if I can see if we've got everybody again. Okay, all right, it appears she can vote. Uh, she can hear us, but uh, she can't get her screen up. So I'll close the motion and uh, please cast your vote. Okay, that is carried unanimously. Um, so, uh, Councillor Macon informed me that her computer has gone into a reboot, and uh, so she is advised uh, to go on with the next item, and she will try and get back on um, to be able to uh, speak at uh, some point in time. So, we will proceed. So, uh, thank you very much, Brad and Janelle. We will go on with the next item, which is special uh, scheduling, special council meetings. Ms. Moulter. Your Worship and members of council. Um, tonight, I'm making a presentation to request two special council meetings be uh, scheduled for the purpose of conducting the city manager performance evaluation. The dates proposed are June 18th at 2 p.m. and June 21st at 3 p.m. Uh, with the intent of being able to hold them either virtually or in person. Okay, I'm just gonna look to see if anybody has any questions on this one. And if not, I will go to Councillor Sperling for a motion. I'll make the motion that council schedule special council meetings for June 18th, commencing at 2 p.m. and June 21st, 2021, commencing at 3 p.m. and that the special council meetings be held in camera to discuss the city manager's annual performance review in accordance with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, section 19.2, confidential evaluations, and further that these meetings may or may not be held virtually. Thank you. Do you wish to speak in favor? 
Uh, just a normal course of business for uh, for the city, and uh, it's an annual review we do every year uh, with our CAO. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to look to see if anybody has anything on discussion and debate. Okay. Councillor Lennox. I just have a question. I'm just have we decided? Are we just waiting to see whether or not that's going that they're going to be held virtually, or when are we making that determination? I believe um, it will be based on the restrictions of the provincial government. Mr. Fleming, you can confirm with me if the restrictions are lifted that you can have indoor gatherings of a certain number. We have the ability to do it uh, in person if council uh, feels comfortable enough. So we will have that opportunity uh, to make that decision. Through your worship, they they are uh, business meetings, so they're actually they're permitted now. Um, it's just it's a conversation we were going to kind of have with council offline to see what everyone's comfort was. Okay, thanks. Okay, not seeing any additional questions. Anything on close, Councillor Sperling? Nothing on close. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So the motion is now closed as presented. Please cast your vote. That is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, moving right along, uh, going into our bylaws. So item 9.1, bylaw C15-21, uh, Matthew Siddons presenting. Good evening, your worship and members of council. I'm Matthew Siddons, current planner, and I'm here to present Bylaw C15-21, which is a redistricting bylaw for Windsor Point, uh, stage six. Lands to be redistricted are in the Windsor Point community of West Park. Uh, this redistricting application was submitted by WSP on behalf of Landrick Sinks. Uh, bylaw C15-21 redistricts lands for low density residential, as well as for uh, public utility. The Windsor Point Stage 6 redistricting complies with the Municipal Development Plan. The MDP designates this area as developing community and the MDP articulates objectives for developing neighborhoods and sets the direction for area structure plans. The West Park Area Structure Plan designates this area as slow density residential, as so shown in yellow. Uh, typically, it includes housing that does not exceed 35 dwelling units per net developable hectare. Uh, this higher level plan identifies general areas such as residential and commercial areas, and collector roads. The Windsor Point Outline Plan designates this area as low-density residential, as shown in yellow, and low-density residential includes single detached dwellings, semi-detached housing, and multi-detached housing. The, low, the lands zoned as RC Comprehensive Plan Residential District are shown in orange. They're located west of West Park Drive and north of Wingate Way. Lands shown in blue will be redistricted as public utility. But the lot will accommodate underground service lines and serve as a trail connection. Should Council give first reading to bylaw C15-21, public hearing will be advertised as per the requirements of the MGA. Landowners within 100 meters of the property will be mailed a notice. A copy of the proposed bylaw will be made available on the city's website, and an advertisement will be placed in the Fort Saskatchewan record. The target date for the public hearing is July 6, 2021. I would like to take this time to answer any council questions. Okay, thank you. I'm first, but I have no questions. I'll go to Councillor Lennox. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I don't have any questions either, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Macon. 
No questions. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Matthew, one easy question. The term low density residential does or does not include what we call zero lot line development. Uh, do your worship to Councillor Kelly. Uh, zero lot line development would be considered low density residential development. It fall, typically falls under that 35 dwelling units per net development factor. I thought this council only approved zero lot lines on a trial basis. So does this proposed development include any zero lot line lots? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, this district does not include any zero lot line lots. This is for the RC district, and that doesn't include any um, zero lot line lots. Uh, any zero lot line lots in Port Saskatchewan are currently under direct control districts. Perfect. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. No questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Yeah, I do, Matthew. On um, on the out uh, on the outline concept plan, um, it's got. Um, a blue star and a red star, MR option one assumes lane development and MR option two assumes laneless development. Um, I presume that both those park spaces will not be integrated into the urban development when it's finally complete. Which one will actually take place? Yeah, in that picture. Is the one with the blue dot on it the one that's going forward in this context at this time? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Harris, uh, in this concept, um, there was two options that the developer was going to provide for um, park dedication. So in this case, they're not going forward with option one. They're going to go forward with option two. So the park space will be located in the north area of the Windsor Point outline plan. Okay, so then the, um, the lift station... Um... Uh, utility corridor runs through that red dot area, correct? Uh, do you worship to or Councillor that... Harris? Uh, I, I believe there is uh, some stormwater drainage that might or might, that might run through that through that area. Okay, all right. So so ultimately that will be developed in the next stage. So there won't be an additional park space other than what's down on the south side. That's adjacent to the uh, uh, Point of Pins Road. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Harris, that's correct. So there'll be two park sites. The one on the south is uh, currently being developed. Yeah. And then the one with the red star will be developed as well. Okay. So then the other the other ones are the utility right of ways, the trail connections to the existing trail by the Ball Diamonds, and then these new lot types. That will be, and they're working down there right now, moving dirt. Is that correct? Uh, that is uh, through your worship to Councillor Harris. That is correct. They're currently uh, um, working on that area right now, and uh, the PL connections as well. Okay. So the question on West Park Drive: What's the status of that road um, relative to this? This is stage. Is this stage six? Through your worship to Councillor Harris, this is stage six. So uh, this just redistricting is for stage six. And uh, Landrix is currently working on stage five this year. They have a subdivision plan in with the city. So the plan for West Park Drive is that this construction season, so this summer, they're going to be building a temporary uh, road connection, West Park Drive, that will connect from, from uh, Woodbridge, will connect West Park Drive from Woodbridge Link in the north to um, we'll share a boulevard to the south. So there'll be a temporary road connection. And then next construction season, so that's in 2022, uh, both Landrix and Qualco, who's a developer in Forest Ridge, will be constructing the permanent uh, road for West Park Drive. So at that time, the permanent road will be completed. And while it isn't necessarily germane to this conversation, the picture that you've got up shows the conceptual lot layout for. Qualico subdivisions, which would interface with the West Park Drive extension, correct? Yeah, do you worship to Council Harris? Uh, that is correct. Uh, this, this configuration for Forest Ridge has changed. So uh, uh, Qualco has submitted an updated uh, outline plan for Forest Ridge. 
but there will be some lots kind of facing onto West Park Drive. If council approves that. Okay. It's we won't go there. So you've answered my questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. Actually, my questions uh, have been asked, so thank you. Okay. Thanks for the so, presentation, Matthew. All right. Thank you. So I just want to make sure everybody's got their questions uh, asked. Is there anything further? Not seeing any. Thank you for the presentation. Um, Let's see, I'll be going to Councillor Lennox. Would you like to put the motion on? Sure, I can do that. I move that Council give first reading to bylaw C15-21 to amend land use bylaw C23-20 uh, as presented and further that a public hearing be scheduled. Okay, thank you very much. Would you like to speak in favor of the motion? Um, I think it's just the first step in the process and the next We'll go to a public hearing and go from there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll just go through the list and see if there's anything on discussion and debate. Councillor Macon, you're good. Councillor Kelly. Nope, you're good. Okay, thank you. Councillor Abatoye. No problem. Thank you. Councillor Harris. You're good. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. Okay, and I'm good. Anything on close, Councillor Lennox? Nothing further, thanks. Thank you. So the motion is now closed on first reading of bylaw C15 21. Please cast your vote. Sorry, Your Worship, just a, a bit of a delay with Councillor Abatoy. In favor. That is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving right along, bylaw C17 21 for first reading. Matthew Siddons presenting. Thank you, Your Worship. So I'll be presenting bylaw C17-21, which is which would add a new direct control district to the land use bylaw. Uh, this land use bylaw amendment application was submitted on by InvisTech Consulting on behalf of the property owners. The amendment would add a new direct control district to the land use bylaw. And this district is intended for mixed use development and it would be applied to rezone two lots along Towncrest Road direct to direct control. Uh, the lots to be redistricted are located between Highway 21 and Towncrest Road in the Southport area. The direct control district complies with the city's planning policies. The municipal development plan designates this area as developing community and the MDP articulates ob objectives for developing neighborhoods and sets direction for area structure plans. This area is identified as a node within the MDP. The South Fort Area Structure Plan designates this area as commercial, as shown in red. Commercial sites should provide opportunities for residents to access uses and services for their daily needs. And the proposed direct control district aligns with the policies of the South Fort Area Structure Plan. The South Fort Ridge Meadows Outline Plan designates this area as commercial, as shown in red, and the proposed direct control district aligns with the outline plan. The Comfort Inn and Suites and South Fort Inn are located on the site. Uh, the Towncrest Road commercial site is across uh, the street. The Fort Sass Park and Ride is within 100 meters of the two lots, and the Dallas Centennial System center is within 300 meters of the site. The proposed district would allow for the site to be redeveloped as a mixed use node. Uh, the district accommodates commercial, residential, and residential care uses. 
and the district allows for a mix of uses, provides amenities for residents, and sets the criteria, the criteria for ground level commercial developments. And this district does not include vehicular oriented commercial uses such as drive throughs. Should Council give first reading to bylaw C15 21, a public hearing will be advertised in the Fort Saskatchewan record for two consecutive weeks. Landowners within 100 meters of the property will be mailed a notice, and a copy of the proposed bylaw will be made available on the city's website. The target date for the public hearing is Tuesday, July 6, 2021. I would like to take this time to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, Matthew. Uh, Councillor Macon, questions? I don't have any questions. Okay, thanks, Matthew. Thank you, Councillor Kelly? No questions, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye? I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harris? No questions. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. I have no questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. I just have one question. This would be similar to one that we approved not too long ago for the Ross Creek area where they wanted uh, different uh, different developments uh, allowed on the site. Uh, to your worship, this would be similar to the direct control district that was approved for the Ross Creek crossing area. In this case, the property owners are looking at possibly developing one of the sites into like a res residential use or an assisted uh, living facility. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lennox. Thanks, Matthew. I do have a question in the report. It says the area is within close proximity to Highway 21 and the protective services building, which can be above average sources of noise. At the development permit stage, the development authority may request the completion of a noise attenuation study is what is that a may or is that a will and how is that decided and is the developer aware of that uh, to your worship to councillor lennox so one of the requirements in the district under section 11.20.10 is for noise mitigation and that a noise report may be prepared by a qualified professional for the site uh, prior to the issuance of development permits. So in this case, development authority can ask that the uh, applicant provide a noise report study for, for the site. And the applicant is aware of these regulations um, that they've been added into, into the district. And they're kind of aware of the elements that talks about in terms of noise mitigation, such as the provision of noise attenuation mall walls and increased landscaping. I'm just wondering why is that a may? Like it makes it sound as though it could or could not be asked for and completed and why it's not just done. To worship to Councillor Lennox, um, we thought that in terms of, of this district, in, in most cases, when there is residential adjacent to the highway, the city does request like a noise attenuation study, like a noise attenuation study be provided by the applicant. Uh, Your Worship, if I could just add to that to uh, Councillor Lennox, um, this district also is, uh, it does allow for a number of uses that are not residential. Um, so it would be development specific. We could see maybe a portion of a building being converted to residential or residential care. Um, and the remainder would stay as hotel or it could maybe turn into something else. Um, so that does give the development authority some uh, discretion to ask for uh, a noise attenuation study or uh, the extent of such a, a study depending on the development itself. Um, if an application would be for a more sensitive use like um, a complete conversion of, uh, of one of the buildings to residential, uh, the intent would be that a noise attenuation study would be asked for. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Macon, would you like to put a motion on? I will. I'll make a motion that Councillor is relating to bylaw C17 21 as presented and further that a public hearing be scheduled. Okay, thank you. Would you like to speak in favor of your motion? 
Yeah, we already, uh, as was previously said, we've approved another one of these developments in a different district. I think that they are a great way to uh, repurpose and to bring some life into um, some of our businesses that have seen a downturn over the last couple of years. So I'm happy to see this one coming forward. And I look forward to um, the public hearing if it passes. Okay, thank you very much. I'll open it up for discussion and debate. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you're next. Yes, thank you. I'll support the motion as well. It's important as a council that we offer opportunity and encourage some of our business owners to take the steps necessary to remediate their investment, do what they can to salvage their investment, it does the investor and it does the community no good to have stranded capital um, idle within the city of Fort Saskatchewan. I wish them well and I hope they come up with a solution that suits their needs and the communities as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Councillor Abatoya and discussion and debate. Support the motion. Uh, oh, oops, sorry. Uh, Councillor Harris. I'll support the motion as well. Thank you. Councillor Sperling. I'm going to support the motion. I think there's some good synergies there too with some uh, light retail shopping, the access to the Dow Center and the uh, bus access uh, very close to that location. So uh, it might be a good fit for the for the region and a bit of an economic boost for some of the businesses there as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have no comments on this one. Uh, Councillor Lennox. Yeah, I think it's a, an interesting opportunity and um, as Councillor Sperling stated, like having the amenities close by there, I think, um, you know, I, I would almost um, say that it would be a, a good, really good place to live um, for somebody that is, could be close to, to transit and and well within walking distance to most things. So I think it's a really interesting opportunity. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Councillor Macon for close. Nothing further. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So the motion is now closed for first reading of bylaw C17-21. Please cast your vote. Ms. Exley. Yes, your worship. I'm just waiting for Councillor Abatoy. In favor. That is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. You were muted, Mayor Catcher. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> One more to go. Uh, bylaw C16 21 uh, to amend the elections bylaw. Uh, Brenda Moulter presenting. Your Worship and members of Council, I'm presenting a recommendation for an amendment to elections bylaw C4 21. The amendment would grant the returning officer with the authority to tabulate uh, advanced votes, uh, special ballots, and institutional votes um, starting at 7.30 p.m. at the counting centre on election day. This is a new provision that's um, recently been put in the elections bylaw. And although the number of votes for ballots we're talking about would be um, fairly small in comparison to election day, it would be beneficial uh, to with the overall count. So with that, I am requesting uh, approval of three readings for this amendment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna ask if there's any questions on this. Okay, um, I did have one question. In the, um, in the motion, it says prior to 8 p.m., but in your uh, report, it says starting at 7.30 p.m. So I guess I just ask on the motion, 
why it doesn't say that uh, shall be at 7.30 p.m. Because um, if we approve it prior to 8, I mean, it could be at any time. Um, to your worship, um, actually, the legislation is clear. It's not until 7.30. And so the bylaw itself does specify after 7.30. It's just the way the, the motions were written. I realized that after, and I just wanted to make that clear. It is true. It, the legislation would stand over the bylaw anyways, that we cannot count or tabulate prior to 7.30. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Kelly, would you like to put on four of them one at a time? I will, but a question of Brenda or perhaps Cheryl, if she can hear, would it be possible to just change these motions to be consistent? So rather than say prior to eight, say after 7.30 p.m., is that possible? Yes, that could definitely be done. Okay. In that case, I will move the council give first reading to the amending to to the amending elections bylaw C16-21, which grants the returning officer with authorization to tabulate advanced institutional and special ballots after 7:30 p.m. on election day. Okay. Thank you. I'll accept that motion. Would you like to speak in favor? Uh, it seems very straightforward. Nothing to add. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, they have made that change. So I'm just going to uh, look at anybody and see if anybody has anything on discussion and debate. Uh, Councillor Sperling. Just a quick comment, actually. I've run in two separate uh, elections. In my first election, I was a uh, very close uh, uh, rate in a very close race for the last position on it. I never found out till noon the next day uh, whether or not it got in. So it was the speed at which we were tabulating votes. And in my second term, uh, I found out about three in the morning, I think, that I was uh, elected again to council. So my question, I guess, is uh, this will speed up the vote counting process? Uh, your worship to councillor sperling um yes i agree anything that we can do uh to streamline the process to become more efficient that is the intent definitely excellent thank you okay, thank you not seeing any additional discussion and debate councillor kelly anything on close nothing on close call a question please thank you the motion is now closed for first reading please cast your vote That is carried unanimously. Thank you. Would you like to continue? Certainly. I move the council give second reading to the amending elections bylaw C16-21, which grants the returning officer with authorization to tabulate advanced institutional and special ballots after 7.30 p.m. on election day. Okay. Thank you. Anything further on speaking in favor? Nothing to add. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have anything on discussion and debate? Not seeing any, um, assuming nothing on close. So uh, motion is now closed for second reading. Please cast your vote. That is carried unanimously. You can uh, continue with unanimous consent. I move the council provide unanimous consent to proceed with third and final reading of the amending elections bylaw C16-21, which grants the returning officer with authorization to tabulate advance institutional and special ballots after 7.30 p.m. on election day. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to look to see if anybody dis uh, is descending on this one. If not, I'm going to close the motion. Please cast your vote. That is carried unanimously and you may proceed with third. Thank you. I move the council give third reading to the amending elections bylaw C16-21, which grants the returning officer with authorization to tabulate advanced institutional and special ballots 
after 7.30 p.m. on election day. Thank you. Is there anything on discussion and debate? Not seeing anything. I'm going to close the motion. Please cast your vote. That is uh, carried unanimously. Thank you very much. All right. Are there any notice of motions? Not seeing any. Are there any points of interest? Are there any counselor inquiries? I think everybody's totally exhausted. It's been a very, very long meeting. So uh, with that, um, the time is now 944 and uh, I am going to declare the meeting is adjourned and thank everybody for their wholesome participation tonight and good night. Have a good night.